and it is 1.30. This is a joint meeting of the Senate Finance and House Energy and Technology. Have I got that correct? And we are here uh, to talk with Commissioner Tierney about the Department of Public Service. I think we've all heard the extensive plan um, to get this, the entire state hooked up. But um, I learned this morning, or a few minutes ago, actually, in joint fiscal, that it looks like right now the guidance from Treasury is that any money we spend from the present COVID um, money has to be spent and the project done by January. So we are looking at the next eight months, uh, one building season, and um, wanted to talk to the commissioner about because that emergency plan um, is also contingent on further federal funding, which right now we don't have. So we wanted to talk about what could we do in the ensuing six months. And then um, the end of last week, there was an announcement that Comcast was extending service to 400 homes, which was, I think, news to all of us um, and a little surprising. So I thought we'd let the commissioner tell us a little bit about that and what's involved and then um, go on with any kind of plan B. I represent Brigland, is that where you- That sounds want? great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. So commissioner, the floor is yours. Unmuted myself. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair, is it? S Sir Chair. And, uh, and it's awfully good to see all of you here today. Chair is good. Um, can can everybody Please. hear me okay? June, you can call me Brian. Don't 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 worry about it. You don't have to call me Chair. You, you, you don't want to be Lord <laughs> Campion, is that right? Okay. <laughs> Or Lord Briglin. All right. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to, to meet with you today in this manner. I think it's absolutely critical at this time that um, we have folks in the room together as best as we can. Um, the emergency plan that the department put out very much contemplates a team Vermont approach to getting something essential and good done for uh, Vermonters who right now have no connectivity. Um, I'm mindful of what uh, Chair Cummings just said about the two specific areas of inquiry. And I want to give uh, all of you comfort that these facts have been uh, front and center for the department and its work in the broadband area during the pandemic. What I mean by that is that um, I'm under no illusion that the emergency broadband plan can be achieved in the next eight months. It can't, um, but that isn't the point of it. The point of it is to address um, a need for universal connectivity in Vermont so that as we move forward in the pandemic and beyond, uh, all Vermonters have this uh, fundamental ability to use the internet to protect themselves if they have to shelter at home, um, to, to continue their schooling if they have to shelter at home, uh, to get telecare, telemedicine, telehealth if they have to shelter at home, and to continue their employment or uh, find new employment if they have to shelter at home. And it isn't just a pandemic that causes Vermonters to need to shelter at home. It is also natural disasters like Tropical Storm Irene, as we know too well. There's a continuing question mark around this particular pandemic that we're dealing with. We like to think that we know it's going to last 18 months, but we frankly don't. We like to think that we're getting on the other side of the, um, the immediate um, caseload or infection rate that the state has experienced, but uh, that is our best projection. We can't be sure there won't be a second wave or a third wave in the coming months. So um, that has been the impetus behind the department um, wanting to address the vulnerability of Vermonters who have 
no connectivity or connectivity that is well below the federal standard of 25.3. Um, Chair Cummings has asked two questions, one about the Comcast announcement, and then secondly about what we can do in the next six to eight months. Starting first with the Comcast announcement, just to put it in um, context, um, on April 10, I had asked all Vermont utilities, all internet service providers in Vermont, all telcos and cable companies in Vermont to step up and do what they could in order to uh, help us get connection to people who don't have any or very little. And uh, many companies have responded. The announcement from Comcast is their response to that call to action on April 10. They are accelerating their build out that was already in the works for them. And they've committed to having that done before the end of the year. This is not a draw on COVID-19 money. This is not a draw on state money. Um, my understanding is this is a build out that they are required to do as a result of a, a proceeding that uh, related to their CPG renewal before the PUC last year. So the, the pickup here is the time frame to which Comcast has committed. They've said that they would uh, have that 430 um, house um, construction project done by the end of the year. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, on the second point about the six months, um, Chair Cummings and Chair Berglund, um, I think my, my judgment, and I'm happy to be corrected by others, but my judgment is that the COVID-19 money is not fundamentally directed at infrastructure for broadband build out. It is more directed at putting funding into existing programs or pilots that are directed at buying down the affordability or the cost of broadband. Under limited circumstances, the money appears to be available to um, bring about a service drop, for instance, for individuals who qualify for treatment from the Veterans Administration, but who perhaps um, don't have a broadband connection at their house. Picture, for instance, the veteran who lives in a neighborhood where um, there is fiber that is going by or cable that is going by, and that veteran has not chosen to take service so far. Um, under the COVID-19, um, the CARES Act legislation, as I understand it, that individual would be eligible to get a service drop made so that they could have um, access to telehealth or Veterans Administration um, care. But that isn't the kind of, um, th that's a very limited scenario and otherwise I don't think uh, translates to other uses of COVID-19 money to build infrastructure for broadband build out. Um, so what we can get done in the next six months would be uh, more line extensions, uh, facilitating um, uh, make ready orders, uh, fast tracking siting to the extent that companies have uh, projects in the pipeline that uh, could be helpful on the connectivity front if they were completed sooner rather than later. Uh, but don't think that the purpose of the, the plan that the department has put forward is uh, one to be served in six months time. Um, at this point, Chair Cummings, I don't know whether you want me to continue or whether you'd like me to stop for questions, but I hope that today's meeting is every bit as much about getting feedback from, um, from you folks as it is um, in doing anything else because the department is, is presently in the progress of meeting with stakeholders to get feedback on the plan um, because I, I do have a very firm um, sense that there will be more stimulus coming out of Washington, D.C. I was at a town hall meeting with Representative Welch yesterday, and that's very clearly where he and other members of the federal delegation are headed in D.C. to get more um, funding down the road. And it is so very important that Vermont be ready for that and have a, a proposal that um, we have consensus behind as much as we can manage. And so that's the conversation that the department kicked off with the Emergency Broadband Action Plan. And your feedback, of course, is absolutely critical. Okay, I believe Senator McDonald has a question. I'd also like to get in the queue, Campion. Okay, I think we're going to up. We are doing blue hands. Okay, if we do the blue hands, I have 
Senator McDonald flashed a sign that said, what speed are we talking about on the Comcast? And then I have Representative Chestnut Taggerman and Representative Yantachka. And so we'll go with the, the speed and then- Ann, can you put me in um, that too also? And, and champion. champion, okay, Senate, we don't usually do this, Campion, um, and yeah, Tachka, okay, Commissioner. So I'll have to ask Clay if he has that information at his fingertips. So the, the question Clay, are you is, with uh, us? what are the speeds that uh, yes, he I am? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. My question is um, state policy. Yeah, yes, I don't know if I can see you because you're not on my screen. Spend speaking, money for 100, but... 100. OK. Is the commissioner's testimony, is the, has the commissioner's right. testimony been in support of Putting out 100, 100 or up to 25.3. Okay. I, I understood the question. Senator McDonald, are you talking Comcast about operating? the Comcast announcement? Because Yes, that's what I understand. I understand that. Talking about play. the discussion that we're having You're asking about, what? about in, installing. Federal definitions or Vermont definitions? Uh, I think the, okay. the um, answer to your question what, is what are they are obliged to build out under broadband service? Okay, I'm going to need we'll this. I'm going to need hands. The... Okay, this is a previously approved build out, right? So Clay, what do you know what speed we're talking about? Are they, what are they streaming? Sure, so Comcast, um, just to be clear, it's not a, a state funded project. Um, Comcast is doing this on their own. Um, the speeds that they'll offer are uh, the same that they already offer in the rest of their territory. Those are speeds that meet or exceed the federal definition in all likelihood, they're not going to have a service offering that meets the state definition of 100-100. Okay, so this is generally not, they are not um, stringing fiber. This is in, not in a this... fiber to the premises project. It's a cable line okay. extension project. Yep. All right. So, so we, we are, our goal in this, hearing is to decide whether or not we want to accept that or to use money to meet the um, tomorrow's standard as opposed to yesterday's standard. I think, Senator, our goal in this committee was to get a report on what Comcast had announced. I think what I heard is that this was a previously required extension um and that they were moving the time up on it i don't know that we have any approval thank you. disapproval on it thank you okay thank you uh, thank I'll you very much stand corrected commissioner if that's not if i did not hear things correctly no no madam chair that is correct uh and as okay. clay has pointed out this does not involve the use of state dollars and um yeah, that's that's about where we can leave it here. So they they have okay. stepped up in and accelerated their construction schedule. Um, I think as a means of trying to further connectivity in Vermont at a time when it's needed. Okay. All right. So let's. Have I got any more questions at this point? Uh, yeah, I have one. Okay, oh, that's right, I've got, I'm sorry. I'm looking for hands. I have Representative Chestnut Taggerman and then Yantachka and Campion. 
Okay, so representative. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thank you, June. I, I, have a, I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to condense it. <laughs> um, and my major concerns are around the, uh, um, you're saying that the CARES money is, does not appear yes. to be for infrastructure, but more for access. But it seems to me that there are pieces of it, particularly for healthcare and education, which could be used for infrastructure. Um, and then linked to that is with the time frame of December 31st, um, what are the existing technologies that can get us some results by then? And, and it, I mean, it would seem to me to be pretty much limited to wireless. And I don't know enough about wireless to know what the options are, what the capabilities are, but it would seem to me that suddenly that's the major tool that we're talking about for quick results. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are there. Okay. Well, thank you. I think those are excellent observations. And I don't mean to suggest that there's an absolute bar to COVID-19 money being used for infrastructure build out with the example of uh, the Veterans Administration. I was making the point that there are certain narrowly drawn categories, but it's not predominantly directed at, or it's not freely available to be used the way this state, for instance, might find it most beneficial, which would be to build out infrastructure and, and buy down subscription rates. But that said, you're quite right in the telehealth arena and also in the education arena, there are what I'm going to call stretch arguments to be made that you could use COVID-19 money. And I have an example of a project in a moment that I'd like to describe to you along those lines. But my point is it's not, um, it's not a winner. It's not an absolute, um, yay, let's, let's um, get a touchdown with this that you would wish mm -hmm. the COVID-19 money would be. And so again, um, the, the department has undertaken an exercise to devise a plan to address an immediate need that I see that the pandemic has made apparent. And so um, it's directed at drawing down other federal funding, not making use of the CARES money or not predominantly making use of it. Uh, in answer to your question about what the immediate solutions are, this is where the rub is. And this is what um, all of the folks here are struggling with, I think, as much as we are and um, other stakeholders. The short-term solutions would contemplate investment in technology that is not fiber to the premises. But our, uh, for many people, at least, the state of preference is fiber to the premises. And so certainly among the technologies that would be most readily deployable would be Wi-Fi technologies. And in turn, that is one reason why the department um, was very quick off the mark to seek the deployment of Wi-Fi hotspots because th those were immediate ways to get to people who had nothing to get them something. But the, the state will have to square um, whether it wants to have a, an interim solution deployed for people that depends on the use of a technology that is not fiber, which so many people prefer. Um, as for details about technology, um, I would I would suggest the thing to do would be for us to talk offline about that if you like, um, because I can get pretty weedy. Does that answer all your, it, your, your questions? It, it does, mostly. Um, I mean, I well, think- what part have I not answered? So, okay. so you're, you're absolutely yeah. right in that I have been one person advocating for uh, fiber to premises, 100, 100, yeah. future proofing, call it whatever you want but recognizing that the landscape has changed significantly in that we don't know whether schools will open. We don't know how hospitals will be functioning. We don't know about second or third waves. And our priority needs to be then rapid deployment to uh, critical areas as opposed to future proof deployment everywhere. So I think it's, we're asking a totally different question than we were two months ago. 
Well, fair enough. I mean, to the point, um, and Chair Cummings and uh, Chair Berglund, you'll have to rein me in if I'm not following the format that you want this hearing to take, but there's a, a project, for instance, that we've been facilitating in the Northeast Kingdom. It's in the Kingdom East School District. Uh, that's a district that has eight towns in it and 1,800 students. Through the survey work that we've been doing, um, we've identified 150 students who lack broadband at home. And there's a collaboration that's been worked out between um, Northeast, um, let me see, it's, um, uh, I think New England Wireless, there we go, and Belco. And that solution costs $230,000 and could reach those 150 kids in the space of four weeks and also pass addresses at Linden Institute, I think. That's an example of a project where I would advocate for a very um, stretch argument if necessary to draw down such CARES monies as are available to fund a project like that. Here's the kicker. It involves a wireless solution, combination of, um, of Velco's uh, fiber and wireless uh, equipment. It's not uh, a fiber solution. That's an awfully good option for 150 kids who have nothing, mm -hmm. but um, it also creates the tension that um, people will say, well, you've got something, so now you don't need fiber, or at least not right now. And um, I think okay. the way I'm trying to approach this problem is to say, what is an achievable objective that realizes a necessary public good um, for a price tag that we can afford in a time frame that is useful to us. And uh, that kind of solution plays to all of those uh, points. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask that any Senator that has a question raise his or her hand and not flash notes on the screen. And I have um, Chair Bricklin, I'm gonna point put you order, to the Madam front Chair. of the line. Okay. Point of order, Madam Chair. No, point of order. When What's we are discussing point? this topic and the word broadband is used, can we define what we mean with broadband when we offer it? When okay. we're talking about I, going to towers, what are we talking about? Okay, I think the commissioner just did that it would not be fiber to the home. It would no, be no. a combination. I'm All asking right. up and down speeds. I, up if it's and 100 down and 100 speeds. from a tower, then let's okay. say so. Do you know what the speeds would be, Commissioner? I do not right now. I, I do okay. not. I'd have to ask. All right. Something less than 25.3. Okay, let's, um, I've got Representative Briglin, who is the co-chair, so I'm going to him. Um, Commissioner, just in terms of uh, turning to the Emergency Broadband Action Plan, and um, if we're going to focus on some of the immediate actions that you've outlined there, and I think you have, I don't know, five or six that you've listed, um, and I don't know if those are kind of six to 12 month time frame things, but um, considering some of the new information we have on our ability to use the federal money that we have at this point, I wanted to focus on some of those. And I'll just ask one question. I've got a bunch of questions about these more immediate actions. Um, the first one deals with uh, data collection regarding broadband needs. Um, specifically, I think you focus on um, uh, school students uh, and where some of the challenges have been there. And I know that, well, at least in this plan, it says you're working with the Agency of Education, I believe, to gather some of that information. Can you give us a sense as to what that work stream looks like, you know, how granular that data will be and how quickly we'll have that information? I think that will really be helpful to inform your work, our work uh, at a granular basis uh, in the coming months as we're trying to find where the most um, significant issues are in terms of remote learning. Thank you, uh, Chair Berglund. So my Memory is that we just sent over um, a map that the department um, devised that reflects the uh, survey results uh, spread across Vermont. And it reveals um, 
several clusters of need. And I don't know whether you have that map in front of you or not. We don't. But, think, um, can you put that up if we have it? Is so I, think that, there? I think it might be on the, uh, on the uh, Finance Committee website. I is think it, it is. That's what I was wondering. If, yeah. I'm here. Called it's survey on map just kids. The yes. It is on the website. Okay. Okay. And uh, the same email that conveyed that map also conveys a tabulation by town of um, of responses that we received through a survey that my memory is the Department of Public Service conducted. This was part of the outreach that um, began with my uh, my outreach, my request that people contact us at a press conference, right. I think about three weeks ago. So the, the map is, is very instructive. And for me, what it has posed is a question whether you concentrate resources on where the, um, the hot spots are that emerge from the map one of which is, for instance, in the Northeast Kingdom and the project I just described would um, nail a good portion of that hotspot. Or do you focus on the scattering across the state where there are clusters and therefore it becomes that much more difficult to get a connectivity solution to those kids? That's uh, the kind of question that I think uh, right. bears discussion. Um, again, this is an area where I, I like to, um, to hope that stretch arguments can be made, that CARES money could be used to reach these kids. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, who has control of that money. Most of it, my understanding is, has flowed directly to the supervisory units themselves, the, the local educational institutions. And so it's for them to decide how they, they use that money. But your question was about workflow and um, I think the short and the long of it is that the department has been conducting a survey. We've provided this information to the um, Agency of Education. Uh, they've taken it under advisement. Uh, my understanding is that the Secretary of Education has also reached out from his position through the supervisory unions to get information from them. Um, I don't recall seeing uh, the results of that outreach yet. So this map is the... Um is the work of the department in terms of the surveys that you have done and people have responded to. It sounds mm -hmm. like AOE is separately doing um, kind of specific surveys of supervisory unions and building principals to find out how many kids in your school are in, lacking. In, in the early days, that was our ask of the Agency of Education. They had quite a bit on their plate though. So I wouldn't go so far. I, I think it'd probably be best to speak with the Agency of Education about that, but we are coordinating at the staff level. And I, I see Clay has his finger up, so maybe you want to add something. Okay. Yeah, just add one thing. Um, I, I think we've been working with the Agency of Education uh, fairly well uh, to collect this data. We are getting this data from a variety of sources. One is an online survey we have uh, two is uh, folks can call our consumer affairs hotline. And then three, we have um, worked either through AOE or uh, individually with uh, supervisory unions to uh, get information. So some of that information that's on that map, actually about half of it um, comes from data collection efforts that supervisory unions have uh, been conducting. Um, Okay. Um, with the assistance of AOE and with us. So we're getting this information from a variety of different sources. Okay. I'm going to go back to my list and I have Representative Yantachka, Sandra Campion, Representative Sebelia, Representative Campbell, and Senator Pearson. That's the order that your blue hands popped up. So Representative Yantachka, it is yours. Okay, thank you, Commissioner, for being here and uh, giving us support to us. Uh, I'm in agreement that we should try to uh, make whatever arguments we can to get some of that COVID-19 funding in the CARES Act uh, to support broadband deployment. I would imagine that, that, that whether it's CUDs or ILEX or 
uh, cable companies, uh, they probably already have plans where they're, where they're uh, intending to uh, expand their coverage. And many of these may be ready to go, uh, lacking may, maybe only permit process and money. So I'm wondering uh, whether any of those might be accelerated to the point where where they could uh, use the any COVID-19 money that we can get to start early and move fast. Thank you. Do we have, uh, that's do we have shovel ready projects out there? We have, uh, Commissioner we have two, of course, sorry. We, we have two approaches on that. One is the April then call to action, Representative Yantachka that I, I sent out. And so for instance, the, the Comcast project is an example of one of those companies that is accelerating its build schedule. Um, there are others, for instance, uh, Franklin Telephone that has stepped up and lashed, I think something over a thousand, um, oh God. I forget the unit that Kim Gates used the other day in, in the conversation, um, feet, I think. Of, um, of fiber since the onset of the, the pandemic. Um, there are, the other approach that we're taking is um, to look back at the bids that we've had over the last three years from the Connectivity Fund Initiative. These were projects that were engineered and ready to go, but that did not get uh, a grant from the initiative. And we're looking over that list now that we've compiled to see which ones um, perhaps could be revived at this point, and uh, perhaps uh, either CARES money could be used or another funding source could be located. And the criteria that I've been using in working through that list, and I believe we shared it today with um, House Energy Technology, if memory serves, um, my criteria on there is to focus on the fiber projects, the ones that are proposing 100 up, 100 down, and um, there are quite a few on the list. Um, by my math, there was well over a thousand um, locations that could be reached in this fashion. So that's what we have by way of shovel ready. A, a point of concern that I have is, uh, again, in listening to um, Kim Gates give uh, remarks yesterday at the town hall with Representative Welch, uh, she reports that if you are trying to procure fiber right now, you're looking at September before you get it. And then there's an additional challenge of workforce. Uh, Eustace Cable is a company that provides a lot of workers who do um, either cable or fiber stringing in this state. Um, and they are pretty much the, the go-to company for folks who work in this uh, arena. They are going to be limited at some point in their workforce capability. And so the question becomes whether we can get um, enough line workers in to do work, assuming we have the shovel ready project. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so we've got projects that might be shovel ready, but the question is, can we get the cable to string? And can we get the workforce to string it? Um, we seem to have some supply chain right. issues um, that have not, we're not strangers to at this point. Um, are we also looking at where those proposals are as compared to where the um, clusters of need are? You know, that, that's yeah. a certainly, well, yeah. we've, we've got that's a very intuitive question. Yeah. And the answer to that would be that would be my first thing to look at. Yes. This is a, a list that we, I think, just finished okay. compiling when I testified before you folks on the 29th. I had said that work is underway and it was just completed. But that's that makes perfect sense to, to do. And, and that's pretty much the analytical framework that we're using here is how can we take the information that we're getting, um, how can we fit it to the area of most pressing concern, which is getting to kids who don't have a remote learning capability and getting to folks who need telehealth 
telemedicine, and then of course folks who need to work from home um, and to tr look at our data and, our, and the maps that we generate through that paradigm. Okay, Senator Campion. Senator Campion. Thank you. There you go. Here I am. Thank you. So two. Okay, questions. you were two frozen questions. there for a minute. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. So uh, two questions. First, the build out uh, that Comcast is doing. I don't know, Commissioner, if there's still a way to weigh in on that. They're, they're getting kind of close to some towns uh, in my district that that could use their work. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe you could direct us if it's possible to, I'm not sure how that plan was, was put together. And then secondly, you know, we keep, and this is just something, you know, we keep talking about 100, uh, 100, 100. I, I don't think there's another state out there that is at 100, 100. I, I'm, trying to understand 100, 100 myself in a way. To me, it, it the question is, isn't so much that, but is it fiber or is it not fiber? And maybe I'm, uh, you know, uh, you or uh, Clay could weigh in on, on that as well. So thank you. I, I'd be happy to take that uh, I think, um, question. Um, okay, so who, the, who's speaking? Is it Clay? It is, yes, ma'am. Yeah. I, Go ahead, I Clay. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the speed uh, thresholds, they're, they're really buckets, and it's the best way to think of them. Um, and the, the, the buckets um, are labeled in a way to exclude other technology. So when we talk about 25.3, that is the uh, upper limit of DSL. So we know DSL really can't do that. So we've, we've decided that 25.3 is a metric to measure by because it excludes DSL. 100-100 excludes cable. So we know that if it's 100-100 or better, uh, that it's, it's probably not going to exclude cable. The thing with DSL and cable is that they all have some amount of fiber in their network. They are upgradable to fiber to the premises someday. So even if you are making an investment in cable video, um, future upgrades to that same network could someday achieve the 100-100. Um, but it is not fiber to the premises, and therefore it can't do 100-100. So when we talk about 100, 100, it really is fiber. Someday it might be uh, 5G wireless. So where there are 5G deployments, uh, we would expect those to uh, meet the 100, 100 threshold. Okay. Great. Senator Thanks. Campion, does that answer that your helpful? question? That, that's very helpful. Uh, the okay. question about Comcast and build out. Uh, I'm I sorry, think I, I wasn't you quite know, I, I sure I understood it. So I'm let getting me, people frozen. Yeah, let here. me see if I can mirror it back. Okay. Um, Senator Campion, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to mirror it, it back to you and just nod your head. I, well, no, I, I think I understand what you were asking. You, you, you had two points to it. One was you noted that the build out is getting close to your towns. And then secondly, you asked whether there's a way to weigh in on the build out. Okay. That's right. So on the so first it, it one, I'm, like I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sorry, it's close to what? Okay. Uh, it was, it's the land growth. And so I, it's, it's a way to. Is, okay, Brian, we're having trouble with your audio and also I think with the commissioner's audio or your video freezes. Is the question that this Comcast build out is getting close to some of the towns that are in the local CUD? Is that the issue? Uh, just uh, one town Senator in particular. Senator Campion is Vanderbilt. definitely frozen. Um, okay. So um, it seems Madam, to be Madam this Chair, build out and this? its impact on the CUD. Yeah. 
I, I think what, what we could do, uh, Senator Campion, is the department can get a hold of you and we can download your concern. And we can certainly get in touch with Comcast and the CUD and see what can be facilitated by way of conversation between them. At the end of the day, um, you know, Comcast holds the reins on its build out, but um, you know, there's always the bully pulpit. So we're certainly happy to try. Okay. okay. All right, I've got Representative Sebelia, followed by Campbell, Pearson, and now Brock. I think that's all the hands I've seen. So Representative Sebelia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna Are you try and us? be on camera. Uh, no, I'm not okay, and I've got to plug my computer in because my I just got a low battery notice, so. I will be off for a minute. Logging in. Uh, can someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? We can hear you. I can hear you more. Okay, yep. so can it appears hear that there is a delay between when I start speaking and when you hear me, yes. and I can actually hear the echo. The irony of this call is not lost. I'm hopeful on all of those watching it. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one, Commissioner, can you, or, or Clay, can you tell us a bit more about the map um, and the dots? The, so the map that has the dots, the different colored dots, what does that mean? Like, how was that created? Just simply, how was it created? Uh, Representative Sibeli, I'm going to share gonna my screen a, so everyone's seeing the map. Ah, okay. Now we can see the. Um, it, it is coming, slow but sure. So I'll. There it is. Slowly, surely. Okay. So. Okay. Um, I can I can speak to this. Um, well, if you can move it up um, just a little bit, or not get in yeah, the southern county. So the better half of the state is as. Uh, Senator Campion would say. Okay, so that's where the better. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so this map was created um, using data that we've collected from a variety of sources. Um, one is uh, survey data that individual districts have put together, um, working with AOE and with the Department of Public Service. Um, so we don't have data from every district, um, but a few districts. The other is data that we've sourced from um, uh, surveys that we've put out. So if you go to our website, you can take a survey um, uh, based on your address and the issues that you're, you're seeing. Um, obviously for people that lack broadband, um, that's a difficult ask. Uh, so so people can, yes. So I note, for instance, in one of the towns, which I can't see because you haven't gotten all the way to the best, the best part down. of Vermont, um, there okay. is a single dot that is red in, uh, I believe, the town of Whitingham. And I'm trying to understand what, what that means. So we have uh, geocoded all the survey results to our broadband availability data. So you'll see the legend on the right. Yes. Um, this is what should be available at the um, consumer's house. Um, red, is, red is bad, that's not served uh, with broadband. Um, orange is served with DSL. Um, and then yellow 10-1 is also DSL. The lime green and the dark green are uh, cable and fiber. Yep. You'll so, notice that not everyone uh, who has an issue has an issue with accessibility. Uh, that to us indicates uh, an affordability issue. So Clay, the color that I'm seeing, for instance, in the town of Whitingham depicts um, that that is a town that is 
either uh, uh, served by 401 or underserved is that just, that's all it means because some towns yeah. have multiple dots i don't understand the the dots are individual locations that's that's the consumer's location okay, okay. so that means you've received one location in whitingham that's right Yes. Okay. The data would be stronger if we had more okay. locations, um, and certainly um, we can um, share the the link with you so that um, consumers in your districts can um, take the survey great. or call us. Okay. Um, I, because I know my supervisory unions have both compiled data, so I'm just wondering where that data exists and lives. Yeah, so. and we may have been in touch with them. Uh, this is an iterative process. We're still collecting data, so this is okay. subject to updating. And I, I'm, I can't speak to whether we've been in touch with uh, your district's supervisory unions or not. I, I hope so, but if we haven't, we'd love to hear from them. Okay, it does, I, you know, I'm very interested in this. I do feel like this is a pretty, uh, probably our number one priority at this point. Um, is making sure that our kids, and, and I mean, for the fall, that we have a, a backup plan here. Um, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I have another question, um, which yes. is, um, <clears throat> you know, we worked together last year, we brought forward, you know, I, I think it was a, a really great foundational bill, Act 79. Um, and what we've been talking about, at least, um, my colleagues in the house and I it is about how do we accelerate um, that work um, that is envisioned in Act 79. And so my question is for the commissioner, um, you know, is this plan <coughs> built to um, accelerate or is it built to um, spend money? And do you understand, do you understand what I mean by that question? So did you build it in order to um, get things done faster or did you build it um, in case we had money to spend? Like what is, how is it prioritized? Representative Sebelia, are you talking about the emergency plan? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it was the, the big plan. Yeah, the, the plan is built to address what I consider to be a fundamental inequity in the state that has been highlighted by this emergency. It has been built with the anticipation, as has happened in prior crises, that what follows is the availability of sizable federal funding. It is designed to be ready to go should such a funding opportunity come our way. Uh, in terms of getting things done quickly, I have, I have been managing this crisis with three different schedules in mind. One was the immediate need, the other the intermediate, and the other the long term. The way I would classify this plan is it is overwhelmingly directed at something long term, which in this case would be a three year window or two to five years if you prefer on either side. Uh, there is a component of the plan, though, that is directed at immediate actions that I think are necessary in order to provide a variety of tools to a variety of stakeholders who all have an interest in bringing this particular goal uh, to pass, which is to connect the unconnected in Vermont. So in that sense, there are things that the legislature could do immediately that would make it easier or more expeditious for certain kinds of projects to get built. There are things that need to be done if the CUDs are going to be supported in participating in the RDOF auction at the federal level. Uh, that is going to be happening in October of this year. So uh, those are, you know, I, I hope that's responsive to your question. It's not so much either or as much as it entails all of the above that you mentioned. And it before, is. It is okay. responsive. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I have one more. Yeah. Um, okay. One more, just with regard to um, wireless um, technologies um, and Act 79 and this emergency plan. Um, you know, I certainly when we talk about kids and getting kids service, 
um, for school, making sure we have a backup plan for the fall. Um, it's very easy to understand why, you know, kind of piecemealing together um, some wireless solutions may be what we need to do. Uh, but with the line of sight issues that have been so um, well demonstrated through the failure of large federally funded um, wireless projects in the state, um, I, I would not support any kind of wholesale employment of wireless um, in this emergency plan. You know, certainly on a case by case piecemealing together, you know, last mile solutions, certainly. But I just wanted to put that, um, note that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Campbell. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Clay first about the uh, joint project with Velco and New England Wireless in uh, a Kingdom East district. Um, you mentioned that you thought the speeds we were talking about were less than 25.3. Do you have a, a, uh, an estimate of, of the speeds that we are talking about? Oh, you're I, muted, Clay. I thought I had unmuted myself, my apologies. You know, with wireless, uh, the speeds are always dependent on a variety of um, environmental factors. Um, trees and um, you know, the terrain, uh, the distance from the tower. So I think you're going to see a variety of, of speeds um, depending on on uh, how the project is designed and sited. So it won't be the same for everyone. Um, I think with these kinds of projects, it's um, you know something is better than nothing. And New England Wireless does provide a, a decent um, affordable service uh, in the Northeast Kingdom for those who can get it. Um, so I, you know, from what I've heard of folks in, uh, up that way, you know, they're, they're happy to have it. Um, and that this, um, this could be the difference between being not connected and connected, but it's, it's not going to, uh, um, it's not going to be the best possible broadband um, that, you know, money can buy. Um, it, it'll be somewhere in the, you know, five megabits to, to 15, I would guess. Um, okay. I'm sure I'll have Michael Birnbaum emailing me any minute now um, with, with the correct answer, but um, that would be my guess uh, that most people that can receive the service get something between five and 15. Okay. Okay, Clay, is there any question. money in that? Clay, is there any state money going into that project? Uh, not yet. We're looking for funding resources. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think we know yet what the final price tag is. Um, I'd heard an estimate somewhere in the uh, two to three hundred thousand dollar range, but I could be off on that. So um, I don't think we have a, a final price tag yet, but um, it would be certainly something that would be ripe for either connectivity initiative or um, if there is emergency broadband funding available, um, something that we could uh, easily fund and get up quick. Well, I, could, could I, I think we need to tie down the speed then because that is important to some members of these committees. So uh, just yeah. put that in the top of the question list. Could I follow up with the commissioner, though? Yes. I, I think I think I think that it is important to have something uh, more than nothing. Um, I'm I'm talking to you on a wireless connection now. That is, I just measured it. It was about seven, which is it sometimes is higher than ten, but never very much higher than ten. Um, and we're able to do mostly, you know, meetings and 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 streaming videos and everything's at that speed. So it's it's something, it's better than nothing. So I guess yeah, my I question- I can actually qualify my answer. I'm sorry, as I said, Michael Birnbaum will be emailing me uh, anytime <laughs> soon and, and here we go. So um, the equipment that they're proposing actually would um, deliver a minimum of 25, five um, okay. and up to 50 feet. Okay, 
where do I sign up? Um, no, yeah. but the, the, my, my, my question for the commissioner is there must be other locations in the state where we could have a partnership between Velco or a di distribution utility and, a, and, a, and a, a wireless provider to do the same sort of thing. Do we have anything else um, in the hopper or is there, is, is it, would this be a fruitful uh, uh, place to explore you know, for, for something that can be rolled out quickly? Because I think as Representative uh, Chesa Tangerman said, we got to get something out you know, immediately. The, the company that um, put the wireless hotspots out has a similar proposal. Um, the, the Velco New England Wireless is going to use the, the citizen broadband uh, radio uh, frequencies, CBRS, I, I can't remember the full acronym, but um, that's what they're using to uh, bring these higher speeds and uh, the, the company that did the wireless hotspots, RTO, has a similar um, uh, solution that can be deployed elsewhere. So we'd be looking um, at that as a possible project too. Okay. In, anything to add, Commissioner? You're still muted. Yeah. Sorry, yes, um, thank you. So it's it's very helpful to have that feedback, Representative Campbell, and uh, also Representative Sibilia um, and Chair Cummings, um, because it, it's instructive to know that it matters to a variety of members whether state dollars are being used for certain speeds or not, and the department notes that. Um, in terms of whether there are other projects, that's certainly my hope, and that is the um, the function that the department has been trying to serve in brokering these discussions. I mean, Velka was extremely responsive. This was, for instance, their step up after April 10. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's promising that we have such a project already identified. I don't know sitting here today whether there are others, but you can be assured that we're going to be pursuing that angle. Okay. Just as we have been having discussions with the electric utilities about what their role could be, um, in, in terms of a more robust expansion of broadband accessibility in the state. So um, I, I wish I could give you a punch list of 10 or 20 projects that we know we can nail down the way we've done this one. But um, when you think about getting a start, it's so very important to have a, an early success that is demonstrable and that can deliver so that people can see that as a model for th more things to come. Um, I okay. also, Chair Cummings, if I may, there's another map I think that we sent to the committee um, that shows um, the, the survey data um, by school district that I think it might be useful for the That'd committee to helpful. see as well. Clay, are you able to put that map up too? Because that might help uh, Representative Sibilia a little bit in picturing uh, the results. I, 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 yes, but I, I want to be clear that uh, that's not um, our survey data by school district, okay. it's um, broadband availability data by, by school district. Okay, well then I'm, I misunderstood it. Okay, I'm and sorry. I have one, one last question for you, and that is yeah. we're, we're, we're not using any state money uh, to augment the, the Comcast build out right now, but I'm wondering if, if, uh, if, if that would be a, another viable way to get, again, some service to, to, some, to some people, some households. Well, uh, it's like this, there isn't a lot of state money, meaning Vermont state dollars um, that, that I'm aware of. Uh, yeah. There are some dollars in our connectivity initiative fund. Mm -hmm. And it has not been lost on me that a number of your colleagues object strenuously to such dollars being used for purposes of grants to Comcast and the like. So I regard that to be a, a serious issue that I, um, I tread very lightly on. I really don't know how to answer your question because there is a sizable contingent that does not want to see that money used in that fashion. And there is a sizable contingent that wants a solution deployed. If it involves them, so be it. So what I am trying to do right now, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, keep us focused on what we can be Team Vermont about. And um, it seems to me that so far, um, unless I'm mistaken, we can agree that 
kids need to have connectivity if they have to school at home. Um, those people who have nothing ought to have something. And um, as I understand it, there is some willingness, maybe not um, universal, um, to contemplate interim solutions that may not strictly be fiber mm -hmm. to the premises. And if I've gotten that wrong, I would very much uh, welcome hearing from you. Um, okay. That's my feeling. So thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have Senator Pearson next, followed by Senator Brock, Representative Yantachka, and Representative Sibelia. I think that's it. Um, Thank you. I, I guess a good segue into my questions. Um, the, the concern that we're only interested in fiber to the home, I, I think misses a small detail, which I, I don't know, we wrestled with all of these speeds and uh, technological parameters last year, but I think we landed on symmetrical service. And, and so my question is, as I understand, and I've spent a fair amount of time using internet at a property that has this fixed wireless solution that delivers symmetrical service. Um, and that means really what it means is a faster upload, enabling us to, to have conversations like this. Um, and I think that's kind of the principle we landed on, not actually directing necessarily that it be fiber, um, but that the value of symmetrical was, was clear for the future. Um, my question is, fixed wireless seems to be, uh, assuming I understand the technology to some degree, seems to be something that we have the best shot at deploying quickly. And my, what I'd like to hear is, what is the plan? I, I appreciate the, the attempt here is a plan on connectivity for everybody. What is the plan here for the rest of the year so that in the fall when we have flare-ups and kids are forced to learn from home again, we uh, are serving more of our, uh, more Vermonters Red than District. we are serving today, than today. What is the short-term plan? I'm assuming it's fixed wireless, but could, could we talk a little bit about that, please? Okay, I think Commissioner, that one's for you or Clay. I appreciate the observation very much, Senator Pearson. Um, I think that you're asking for a, a plan. And I think that the emergency plan we've put out has certain short term measures that I think need to be done so that we can deploy as many connectivity solutions in the short term as possible. And the plan there is very much all hands on deck who are able to help provision those connections. The first step in that plan has been to identify where the need is greatest and reachable. So if we had, uh, for instance, a, an expedited siting process that would enable poles to be put up, that could carry uh, technology, whether it is a, a wireless solution as you suggested, or whether it's extending a line someplace. If we had um, an ability to offset the costs of a line extension so that a family that has no um, connectivity can afford to get some because their share of a line extension has been defrayed, that would be an immediate step. If there is a cluster that becomes apparent from the maps that we've been creating, the ones that you've seen here, for instance, today, if you look at the Northeast Kingdom, you see one of the clusters that we've been targeting. The plan is to design a project with such partners as can be located and persuaded to participate and get a solution rolled out. Um, that also assumes that we can locate the requisite funding for that. So these are all actions that are being taken in the service of the objectives that you've um, identified. So the the easy one to start with is the streamlining of permit requests that I'm assuming mm -hmm. requires a change in law or authorization of a temporary suspe suspension. Yes. 
Yeah, um, there, uh, and, and just so it doesn't slip off anybody's radar screen, there's also the need to extend 248A. But at this point, in terms of the compressed time frame, we're talking about what is very much needed is uh, a permitting acceleration uh, for so, telecom, much as you folks enacted for energy infrastructure in the wake of tropical storm. Has that request been made, or are you making that request today? I I, I keep feeling the like the the sense of urgency is uh, not quite matching. You're mm -hmm. just worried about that. So. Has any is a committee working on that request? Is the administration made it officially, or where are we at? Uh, that is why we're having a conversation like this today to see what the appetite is for that. So, I mean, if it's the considered wisdom of this group here that that is something the legislature would support, then that is a proposal that I'm prepared to make. And those are all attached to the plan, correct? No, they're not, but my memory is that we gave a uh, draft legislative language uh, early on in the session and um, the legislature okay, would take it up. I remember a whole lot of licensing and suspensions and yeah. um, issues attached to the plan you gave us last week. I'm assuming those are what you would like. And if there Very are much, others, yes. I think yeah okay but to, yeah. But to the specific it's, request about emergency waiver um authority and the like in yeah. answer to senator pearson's question my memory is that the legislature was approached with that in march and i i'm happy to look okay. into we'll, it again we'll but i don't think action it. was taken if there's anything that's not attached to the plan that came in last week let us know and yes of course we'll see yes um i know there's no official bill because i just went over them, but if there's a, a draft bill out there somewhere, if you send it over. We can chase it to ground. We can get to, it to, to both of us. Yeah, then yeah. we'll be ready. Okay, um, Senator Brock, you are next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, what's the strategy to get to the statewide broadband goal of universal access at 100 to 100? What's the strategy? That strategy is laid out in the plan, Senator, and the item one Which, which is plan are we talking about? The Emergency Broadband Access Plan. The actual plan, excuse me. Yeah, I've read it. It, con it, 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 it contemplates that we would go, we, it contemplates that we would go for federal funding, mm -hmm. that we would use that federal funding through the Connectivity Initiative to conduct a reverse auction. Yes. That through that reverse auction, those funds would be dispersed and the projects would be constructed by the winning bids to bring universal access to 25-3 by 2024. So you believe that the reverse auction would result in a combination of bidders uh, who would bring uh, broadband either through wired connection or through Wi-Fi? Yes, my suggestion in the plan is that it be technology neutral. And the purpose of having these conversations right now is to ascertain to what degree there is a consensus that that would be the thing to do. The condition that would be, in my opinion, optimal would be for the auction to be conducted such that the winning bids are symmetrical, 100 up, 100 down. It, it is well within our purview to structure the auction so that bids could be made that perhaps don't contemplate 100 up, 100 down. That's a decision that I would expect us to either reach a consensus on or not. Uh, and that would allow for solutions other than just fiber to the home. But if need be, uh, we can construct that reverse auction in order to further the 100 up, 100 down fiber to the premises um, goal if that is the preference of the consensus. But I think it, your expressed opinion that if we did seek 100, 100, that it is unlikely that we'd be able to accomplish it within the time frame. Is that correct? I uh, know. I don't think so. Uh, th but well, I think I need to know what you mean by time frame, Senator. Well, there are two time frames we're talking. We're talking about the time frame in your emergency plan vis-a-vis yes. -vis the use of COVID funding. Yes. Right? So starting with that, what do you think we could accomplish? I think what I just said, the line extensions, the make ready orders, and, and the like, the wireless solutions and so forth, but the reverse auction is not directed at anything we can do in the next eight months conclusively. The reverse auction is directed at projects that would be built by 2024 using federal funds. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Say again, please. The last. I think part we're of having some trouble list. hearing you, Commissioner. You're fading. The reverse auction. The reverse auction is directed at projects that could be built by 2024 using federal funds. They're not projects that would be built by the end of the year using COVID money. So the, of the various funds that you are suggesting using, could you describe them? They're appended at the back of the- But you mentioned the COVID uh, funding uh, and uh, the restrictions yes. associated with COVID funding vis-a-vis yes. -vis having to be committed prior to year end. There are also other funding sources in there, Senator. They're in the list. There's the, um, let me just, I'll have to go find it for you. Okay. Rural Digital so, Opportunity Fund. Are they attached? They are attached to the yes. plan? The emergency yes, plan? These, uh, yes, they're all called out from pages uh, 18 through 20. For instance, uh, non broadband programs <clears throat> such as the Economic Development Administration, mm -hmm. uh, the um, Northern Borders um, Regional Group. Uh, the Northern, Northern Borders Commission, neither one of which is COVID-19, neither one of which is the federal initiative that I think Representative Welch and Senator Leahy are going to be able to um, pursue for us. Now, obviously, the issue of using uh, the COVID money seems to be a, a bit of a moving target. Uh, I'm assuming that the definition of the availability of funds is that the administration's definition at this point? I would not be comfortable saying that, Senator. That is uh, my learned definition, and I'm certainly a member of the administration, but I cannot say that across the board, I'm representing the administration's definition. We've had you know, slightly different interpretation based on, depending upon when we've heard it uh, from JFO and others as to what that commitment means. And do you know whether that is firm at this point? I'm sorry, Senator. Um, the ability to that, use those funds vis-a-vis uh, -vis commitment versus actual expenditure versus yeah, exactly. uh, in the ground and completed projects. I, I have to say what I can give you is my, my view, and it is very much what Chair Cummings said at the outset of this, um, this meeting. It is that um, the monies have to be spent by the end of the year. I don't think that, in my opinion, there is no ambiguity about that. And it is one of the um, big challenges of this money, quite frankly. Uh, I, am, I, am, I am puzzled as to why the federal government has sent this amount of money with these strings and strictures attached. Because at least in my world, I'm finding it very difficult to actually apply the money to benefit the people it's supposed to help. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but I think we can all agree that the money has to be spent by the end of the year. That's my understanding. That there was a meeting, we were told that money chairs today with treasury yesterday, I gather from people from the administration and joint fiscal. And that's what they were told that it wasn't committed for, it almost sounded like it had to be spent and built. So um, it didn't even sound like we could prepay if we were so inclined. I mean, uh, to be clear, I'm committed to pursuing whatever uses can be lawfully made of that money in this context. If it isn't for stringing a pole and a wire, at least it can be used to buy down the cost of access for people. I think there's a clearer case to be made for that. But fundamentally, um, one of the reasons why the plan that the department has put out is targeted at subsequent federal funding is because of at least my early recognition for which I take responsibility that the COVID-19 money isn't the gift that it seems to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that the federal delegation is successful in getting some of the strictures reversed or relaxed, but um, you know, time will tell that. Well, based on what you know right now, based on what's in your emergency plan, how many uh, addresses or areas will be left unserved once that money is spent? Uh, which money? The, the, the COVID money. Same number. 
Uh, I'm not sure that we've done that analysis, Senator Brock. The plan is directed at fund, it assumes funding that has not yet been granted. If mm -hmm. the funding that we believe is necessary is forthcoming, in my opinion, universal access is um, is achievable, which means nobody would be left behind. That is with it with the emergency money, assuming that you get the amount that you are right. seeking. Yeah. Right, it's not tied to COVID-19 money. Okay. Well, I'm talking about the, though right now, I'm talking about the COVID-19 money in yeah, the emergency yeah. plan. Yeah, if that I understand. Money is submitted at this point, would we, how close would we get to universal coverage or would there be significant gaps? And if so, I'm just trying to get a sense for, you know, what we, what we will be accomplishing if we spend this COVID money as, 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 as we think might be available. I, I don't think I can give you the answer that you need. I, what I can, I think what I can tell you is that um, you will, you will reach many Vermonters who do not have any right now, for instance, the 150 students in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, if we were to assume for a moment that every project that has been submitted to the connectivity initiative over the last three years that did not get funding, in fact, were to get some funding to be built, that would probably be another couple, at least, I wanna say a couple thousand um, locations, but I would want to do the math and add up the spreadsheet that we sent you before I tie myself to that number. But uh, sitting here today, I can't tell you what percentage of the problem we can take care of between now and the end of the year. A lot of that depends on how much um, the companies and the CUDs are able to step in to, um, to do this work. And a lot of it also depends on what the appetite is to accept wireless and possibly cable solutions as interim solutions. So I think asking a very acute question that um, it would be good to have an answer to, but sitting here today, I'm not able to give you that answer. Thank you. Okay. So right now, the question for the legislature is to take a look at some of those licensing and permitting issues that got brought up um, to have the discussion about what speeds will we willingly accept or how much will we hold out for and what impact will that have. Um, and I think that's it. We are talking but your plan requires further funding from the feds. Correct. We're also, I think, today trying to figure out that money isn't here. There's probably a better than equal chance that at some point in the fall or next winter that we're going to have students back learning from home. And I think our concern is how many more of those students can we have hooked up? And I think those are the numbers. Um, we've got the, the, you know, the Northeast Tela and, but, how, you know, we've got Comcast. How many more kids are going to get hooked up with these Comcast initiatives? How many more with the other uh, program in the kingdom? And what else can we do to target those, I believe, red and orange school districts? Um, where a large number, large percentage of your students are not connected. And that's probably where we want to focus is those red and yellow districts. So I'm going back to my list right now. I have Representative Yantachka, Representative Sevilla, and Representative Chestnut Taggerman. And oh, I got two more hands. And then, well, Senator Brock, do you have a further question? I just have one uh, brief question, and that is uh, this, these documents, the plan and the emergency plan uh, that we've been reviewing, these are, uh, I assume, the work of the department. Is that correct? Yes. Have you sought or obtained any outside expertise to review what you've done uh, and uh, to comment or provide additional input to you? So this plan has been published for comment on our website and it has been released, um, meaning we've sent out a press release to all media outlets to let people know it's there. We're now in the process of meeting with the stakeholders, as I said at the top of this hearing. Mm -hmm. 
So we certainly will be getting that expertise that you've um, that you've pointed to. So the product but that you have here. But you not any independent expert to assist you or to review your work. You mean that a is... consultant of some kind? No. Okay, thank you. This is a discussion starting piece yeah. and I very much hope that we will get the benefit of other stakeholders, uh, but no, no consultant. Thank you. Except to the extent that you consider the Magellan report. Okay. Joint Fiscal is interviewing people to provide some technical assistance to the legislature because we don't have any in-house technical assistance. Um, and hopefully they're trying to move that along. I know they've done some interviews, so we may have some of our own in-house technical assistance, hopefully shortly, because this is moving along. Okay, Representative Yantachka. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question about the Rural Develop uh, Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, in your report, it says that it uh, addresses 24,000 locations, and uh, over what time period would that be deployed? Uh, do you have any idea about that? And I also have a question about 5G, but uh, I'll wait for your answer first on that. My understanding of the art of order, keeping in mind that they're coming up with rules right now for this auction, is that there will be a three-year shot clock on the projects. Once they receive a bid, they have to be built within three years. And would that tie in? Would that tie in with any uh, plans that we that are already on the books for uh, where ILEX or uh, CUDs may be planning? Uh, for instance, if, if the funds were approved, I don't know, say in December, would they be? Would do we have projects ready to go? Um, say the following summer in 2021. I, I would have to think that um, that there would be a period of time where a bidder would refine their engineering design before they would be putting shovels in the ground. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. that somebody who wins a bid in the October auction will be ready to put a shovel in the ground in uh, the following construction season. Clay, are you able to shed any light on the question? The uh the winning bidder will receive support um, from the Universal Service Fund over 10 years. Uh, they'll have six years to complete uh, construction in all of the census blocks that they, they've been awarded. So um, there are milestones for each year. Um, and I can't remember the exact milestones, but I think they have to be 80% done by year three or four. Um, I don't anticipate there will be a significant build out in the first year, as June pointed out, that'll largely be a period of, of design um, and make ready. Uh, but years two through six, um, we'd certainly expect um, significant build out in each of those years, unless uh, the winning bidder is a uh, satellite provider um, or a fixed wireless provider that might go faster and they're certainly eligible for, for bidding. And when they, when they say 24,000 locations, are they, is that like 24,000 uh, residences and businesses? I think they use the, the term households and they're using census data. So it's not, um, they're not mapping uh, physical buildings like we map buildings. They, um, they're looking at Census Bureau data for each census block, how many households are in that block. And so the, the eligible um, number is, is households and it's 24,000. Uh, statewide, but they're in very discrete areas. They're in census blocks uh, that are completely unserved with broadband. Okay, and uh, on the section about 5G, the FCC 5G fund, uh, yeah. I thought that the, um, the range of 5G units is only uh, a couple of hundred feet. 
and I'm wondering how that would work in rural Vermont, where we have all these mountains and trees and, and everything else uh, to deal with. Uh, is that really uh, feasible for Vermont? That's a, that's a good question. So under what they call option A um, in the 5G fund report, uh, they make available about 85% of the geographic land mass of Vermont. Um, and that includes areas that are well covered today with 4G LTE. So the fund could be used to bring wireless 5G service to areas that already have good 4G LTE. So it might just become a public subsidy for 5G infill um, in areas that frankly, the, the market might take care of by itself. Um, there is discussion in the 5G uh, fund NPRM about prioritizing areas that have no cell service. Um, that's an area where we'll be commenting and I imagine most states will be commenting um, on that. Uh, but the, the problem with that is that the, the federal mapping is not adequate right now. There was a federal law passed last or a few months ago called the Data Act, uh, which requires the FCC to straighten out its mapping of, of wireless service. Um, and if they do that, um, we might have a better idea um, of what's possible. But it's not clear that what we think of as 5G small cell is what's going to be built. Um, it might just be. Um, what the industry really calls 4G advanced, uh, which will be a better 4G LTE service um, that utilizes existing macro towers and new spectrum that's now available to them, both at the low end, you know, the 600 megahertz up to um, and beyond the, the 1900 megahertz. Hope that helps. Um, well, I, I think so, but. I, I was really questioning at 600 to 1900 megahertz, um, how far does the signal travel? And what, you know, the lower how, the how, many, how many different things are we gonna have? How many uh, yes. different cell towers are we gonna have to put up in order to uh, serve them on? So the lower spectrum um, uh, bands uh, go further distance generally, the higher spectrum bands go a shorter distance. So you'll see the, you know, if it's two, uh, you know, five, I think 5.4 gigahertz or something, if it's, if it's gigahertz, it's going to be a small cell thing in, um, in an urban or uh, suburban environment. And then if it's, if it's in a lower megahertz, 600 was um, TV spectrum that they've taken back or other spectrum that they've repurposed, um, that that will be, um, um, that will be reserved for rural deployment. Um, and then there's spectrum that they foresee being deployed along highways to little installations along roadways um, to provide service. Um, there, there are a lot of different ways to achieve the the 5G speeds that they're aiming for. Okay, thank you. Okay, Clay, we've been being told that when there was all the upset about 5G, that because of the range, it might work in the big cities, but that it wasn't going to be coming to rural Vermont anytime soon, just because of the distance in the trees. Um, is that changing? I mean, are we looking at 5G as a viable alternative for last mile service? Um, I don't think that without a public subsidy contemplated in the 5G fund, which is uh, $9.5 billion, uh, I don't think that we would see appreciable um, deployment of 5G service in rural areas. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see as the rules develop for this fund, um, how, it, how it occurs. I think you'll see it um, in a place like Burlington first. Um, mm -hmm. Over time, you may okay. see it in places like downtown Montpelier, 
downtown Rutland. Um, but I think it's know, already there. Okay. Right, but in Northfield or Bethel or something, you know, we're we're not going to see it anytime soon unless something like the 5G fund really focuses. Um, okay. Attention. And just for clarity, the 5G fund is an FCC federal fund. The state of Vermont is not got a fund to, for that's, the deployment of 5G. That's correct. Vermont does not Thank have you. $9 billion. You it's just cut much. our email quotient in about half. Okay. All right. I've got Representative Sebelia and then Representative Chestnut Hagerman, Senator Ballant, and I've got Chestnut Hagerman again, Hagerman again. So uh, Representative Sebelia. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanna, I do wanna back up um, and just state, I mean, obviously we have seen um, pretty serious effects from not having adequate broadband for our students, for those of us trying to work from home, for access to government. Um, and so I wanna say, I really appreciate actually the department coming forward with um, a plan to get us moving in the time frame that it was done. I think um, there's always room for improvement, for collaboration, for expansion, um, but I wanna say thank you for putting something on the table. And I also want to commend um, and make sure that both committees are aware that uh, the department's work was recently cited during um, an FCC debate, uh, the work that was done uh, by Corey Chase um, and Clay to map uh, wireless signals. Unfortunately, that argument I don't believe won the day, but it was a very important work that was done. And so I do wanna make sure we take the time to just acknowledge that work. So putting this plan down on the table, uh, one of the, uh, another question that I have for you is if we were to say to you, um, Commissioner, please go back and tell us, um, come back and tell us, give us a rough time frame for this. When is this achievable? Um, and I mean, physically achievable and then maybe financially achievable, right? So then those may be two different questions. Um, for me, I have a sense of urgency. If there are zero dollars on the table, I still have a sense of urgency because this is still a problem that we have to solve. So if we were to ask you to go and, um, and come back with a, with a timetable of some sort, how long do you think it might take? And I know we're talking rough. We're talking rough here. We're not talking perfection. How long do you think it might take you to come back with a timetable for the current plan, the emergency plan? While we've been sitting here, um, a bill dropped in the U.S. House of Representatives that proposes $4 billion for an emergency broadband connectivity fund and $1.5 billion for emergency connectivity fund, and then a $50 broadband lifeline credit. And these funds could be used through 2021. So if that uh, money were to come available, meaning it becomes law and uh, we're actually able to get some of it yeah. uh, right there, it has a 2021 timeframe. So, so we would try to tailor our uses to that timeframe. Under the plan itself that we have right now, um, what's contemplated through the reverse auction is that those projects would be built by 2024. Okay, so, um, and again, um, I wanna, it, you know, if we took all of the money off the table, say there's no dollars, okay. we still have had this problem that we were aware of, underscored, yes. highlighted, exclamation points. And, you know, we have to find a way, so we don't have the resources. How, uh, could you come back to us with a plan? Here is, you know, the time frame that we think this could be done in you know, the resources could be secured, the knowledge, the data, blah, blah, blah. Like how long the actual work would take for the items that you have, at least the immediate items that you have laid out here. Okay, so you're living for a, a physical work schedule. How time, you know, if we had all the money in the world or if we had no money, how long would it actually physically take yeah. to string everything we need no. strong? I, I'm saying with the plan that she's that the commissioner has brought, Madam Chair, 
and okay. particularly the emergency, the emergency plan. pieces. Yep. Okay. Um, the immediate pieces. If we were to say to you, okay, there's no dollars, like just come back and tell us physically how long would this take to accumulate the resources and kind of stage the work? Oh, accumulate the resources. All right. Okay. So I think um, I'm struggling with the question because okay. absent money, I, I don't see, because it's not an idle question. The yeah. money lives with the people who are doing the work. Yeah, to me the- so For instance, how much time it takes a CUD to do something, as opposed to how much time it might take Velco to do something, as opposed to how much time it might take um, a, a cable company that's going to string fiber to do something. A lot of that depends on how they manage their capital and their work plans. So I, I would be making um, an academic guess at that or, or, or prediction if that's what you are looking for. But I'm not gonna, it's, not, it's not entirely clear to me. So perhaps I, I, you could take another pass at, at the ask. I, I'm not going to belabor this point. And perhaps this is yes. something we can pick up um, a little bit later. But for instance, you know, could you tell us like, so let's say you have all the money that you need. Okay. What, would the time, what would the time frame be? Like, you know, money is not a question then. You know? I, again, there, there are variables in there, such as whether the workers are available, whether the, the, the fiber can be acquired. Yes. I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to interrupt you because yeah, please do. But my actual question is, could you come back to us with some sort of a rough time frame? Not well, we can, can certainly, tell me now. Yes. Yeah. No, okay. we, we, can, we can rough something out for you. Yes. And that would be assuming that the wire, the light, that everything went according to plan, that you didn't find out that you had a three-year backup in cable supply. Yeah, no, I'm asking for a rough, you know, these folks yeah. are the, you know, these are the experts in, you know, that have been hired to do the job in our state. Um, you know, can they come back and tell us roughly how long this might take? I know we're not going to get precision at this point because we're moving quickly because we have an emergency. Could I, could I ask Representative Sibilio what, um, for one moment, what will, what will that, Let's say that we come back with this plan for you. How will that help your next thinking so that we have that in mind as we're trying to answer your query? So I think if we do have funds to spend, Commissioner, yes. it would be helpful to us to just understand how to okay. anticipate the time frames. Um, you know, we've yeah. heard that there could be time frames attached to when those funds need to be expended. So mm -hmm. I would like to hear from the department about how long you rough roughly would anticipate yeah, these types of projects. I might also suggest that if the legislature is so inclined, um, when you retain the experts in the Joint Fiscal Office, that you have them do that as a parallel project so that you have two um, answers to, to compare. Um, Madam Chair, may I just ask a quick question? Uh, this is Brian Campion, just related to this. Our, our statement, I just want to make sure that we know every time we ask the department to do these, you know, scenarios that could take a lot of time and a lot of effort, that they, it is taking away, I suspect, from other work. So I just want to put that out there. I, 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 I think that's, I'm still struggling, Representative Sibelia, yeah. to say, how long would it take to do the entire plan that was the auction and the build out or no. if we got a small amount of money some money how long would it take to do the i think that's divided by county and how long would it take to do the project in each one of those county districts and maybe so, if you could email it to the commissioner it yeah. might get a little clearer. Sure. Um, I'm talking about the in, the actions that would be able to be taken immediately. So okay. again, immediately. Okay. okay. The first part of the plan. Yes. So the okay. okay. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. The other question that I have is with regard to the reverse auction um, and uh, building out with the proceeds from the reverse auction at speeds of 25.3. Can you... Tell me why we would go to 25-3 with the reverse auction, what, what the thinking was um, with 25-3 on the reverse auction funds when with Act 79 
we require build out with the VITA funds to be symmetrical speeds. Uh, so, if I there, can... uh, Clay, I'll take a first crack at that. Um, I, I don't think we should put undue emphasis on that part of the reverse auction. Okay. Uh, if you keep in mind that this is a, a plan that we've put out there seeking comment, okay. uh, that is the kind of comment that I would welcome. As a lawyer, um, I would offer you this. Um, building some flexibility into uh, a plan or into a rule or law is advisable because there is always that one-off scenario that can't um, meet the the goal or the ideal, but that needs a solution. Yeah. So it's when 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 I put in the plan the concept of an exception to a hundred up, hundred down and uh, being willing to accept a 25-3 solution, it's not intended in any way to be a broad application or to make it the norm, but rather it's to provide for that one-off scenario where that might be the most desirable thing that's attainable at that time, that's all. Okay, Commissioner, I would just note, um, in re thank you, that's helpful. So you're receiving feedback, I would offer this feedback yes. as well. Yes. Um, the last time that we received a large amount of federal, federal dollars uh, for broadband build out, um, we thought that that was going to make things better in my region. And in fact, it made it worse. And it um, set us back, it set the kingdom back um, a decade. Yes. And so for me, when I think about this, I think about not um, investing, you know, once in a decade, unfortunately, or you know, really limited dollars in anything except, you know, the future, a future proof. Um, so I wouldn't want to put us back. No, I think I understand. In, in the law, they call that fencing certain solutions out. It's putting a, a fence around something and saying, not this. And so by adopting the symmetrical standard that you have at the level that you have, you effectively uh, fenced out uh, a recurrence of the scenario that you just um, brought up. And I can understand the instinct to do that. Um, it's as I said, there's always that one off, but um, feedback heard and, and understood, and of course, um, eager to hear from others as well. But the example you've cited is not at all lost on, on me or, the, or others at the department. Okay. I have Representative Chestnut Taggerman next, and then Senator Ballant. Uh, since I have already asked a question, and Senator Ballant hasn't yet, I'm going to. Okay, Senator Ballant, you want to? Thank, Thank you, Representative. That's very kind of you. I want to bring us back to something that I know is on the minds of, of all the representatives and senators on the call, which is that we want to know that we are going to meet some metrics and, and some measurable uh, progress. And I mean, we together, you at the department, and us where we sit. And so I know that uh, I believe on April 13th, um, districts and schools were supposed to submit to the AOE their continuous learning plans for their, their schools and districts. And that was supposed to give us um, information about how many families within a district did not have access to uh, broadband or Wi-Fi, some means for these folks to do learning at home. I don't know how specific that information is, whether it's an aggregate number or whether we actually have the details of the specific families that need the service. But I think we need to head into the next six to eight months knowing what the goal is. Who are those families? Where are they? So that we can circle back around with our constituents and say, did we make it better for you? Like it's the old Ronald Reagan, is life better now? Like it's that simple, you know, come the fall when we have another outbreak, is it better for your school and your family? So how do we get to that, those measurable goals that we can all hold ourselves accountable for? So when it comes to what is in the um, continuity of learning plans, my strong recommendation would be that you have the Secretary of Education in to speak to um, those plans and what they did and did not tell you. 
I can tell you that we at the department moved as we did because we have a sense of urgency and we've done the outreach that we've done to get the data that you're describing because we recognized early on, I think it was one of the first things that Clay testified to when Senate Finance convened the meeting, that there is no good repository of data on the point that you're asking about. And so we set about to create that as best as we could through the survey process and by reaching down into the school districts. So I can certainly sympathize with your objective of wanting to circle back and see who did we help, who did we not. And I think that would be a wonderful um, check on the work that we're doing uh, over the course of the next several months. Uh, it has crossed my mind. I, I had my staff prepare an email that I was going to ask um, the Senate Pro Tem and the Speaker of the House to distribute through all of you to ask that all of you send it out to your constituents so that we could try to do a data catch that way. But I didn't want to overwhelm you uh, with, um, with the surveying efforts that we've undertaken. There comes a point where you get lots of data. And then as Senator Campion pointed out, we've had a lot of uh, demands. I, I had a report repair, prepared today just to give you an idea of how many broadband complaints that we've handled over the last six weeks. Uh, in a given year, we might see 300. In March, we saw 300 alone. So, and the, the complaints vary for different uh, fact patterns. Point being that, you know, we're trying to make good judgments about um, where to get our data, how much data to get and how to use it. So I, I agree with you completely, Senator Ballant, that you've, you've named what it is we need in order to target resources to get kids connectivity solutions. And I think we've made good progress in the last several weeks in developing a picture in the state that gives us an idea of where we need to target resources. But to the extent that you have uh, questions about what the continuity of learning plans told us on the point, I would urge you to, uh, to speak with Secretary French about that. Okay, thank you. Appreciate Absolutely. that. We'll have him back. Okay, Representative Chestnut Tigerman, back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, I, there's, we've been throwing a lot of feedback at you and I'm all recognizing that, that although a lot of it is, uh, um, uh, it's not necessarily all in agreement. No. So, so we're again asking you to thread all sorts of needles and um, walk all sorts of tight ropes. So I'm gonna continue down that line. And, uh, but build it, touching on points that Representative Sibila and Sibilia and um, Senator Ballant raised. Um, I guess I'm, you know, I'm seeing the, the, the plan, which I really appreciate as a, as, as you said, this is what we could do by 2024 with X yes. amount of dollars. Um, so that's one plan. And as I said before, the, the landscape has shifted. So we now need to look at a, a six to eight month solution there. And I'm wondering if you are planning to, um, not, a, not a plan, but a, con a concept or multiple concepts of, well, within the next six months with COVID funding for education and medicine, perhaps, uh, and whatever state funding we would choose to allocate, um, these are options to reach the greatest number of, of unserved areas or with emphasis on schools and on what hospitals, uh, med medical facilities need um, so that there is a, uh, um, I, I guess. Okay, so, can so I ask whoever is not muted to please mute if there's, that, we're getting voice feedback in here. I'll, I'll move. Um, that's my, <laughs> my is wife is you? giving a, okay, a, I'm sorry. a music lesson remotely Thank downstairs. <laughs> um, okay, the, uh, but we have the capacity that we have the broadband capacity that we can both be online at the same time, not to glow. <laughs> <That is good. laughs> um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm seeing we, we have a plan that with a four year time frame or, or 
three years, three and a half year time frame. But we're also need a um, concepts. What's mm-hmm. possible within six to eight month time frame? And is that something that you are planning on uh, providing to us, or is that something you're looking for us to suggest to you? Uh, that is work that is underway as we speak. I thought this was a question that was asked earlier. I think it was uh, Senator Pearson who asked a very similar question. The first part of the Emergency Broadband Action Plan lists several steps that need to be taken in order to create the tools that could facilitate some of that work in the next six to eight months. And uh, the mapping that we've been doing and the data gathering that we've been doing and the crosstalk among agencies, principally the Agency of Education and Department of Health have been directed at exactly what you're talking about. Um, that's, that's why we came up with the map that shows, for instance, from our survey, uh, where folks have uh, inadequate uh, connectivity or, or perhaps it's available, but they're not taking it because there's an affordability issue. And so what follows then is a coordination um, project to make sure that the resources that have been made available to the extent that they can be used within the next six months to get more connectivity out there are known to those agencies so that they can pursue them. For instance, if there's an affordability issue for a student who's been identified through our survey, the next step is to make sure that the local education authority that has received COVID-19 funding is aware of that student situation. And then they make a decision about whether to use it to give them an affordable um, subscription to broadband service. So that, that work is very much underway and I certainly welcome any input that the legislature uh, wants to, to give us. I've certainly gotten quite a bit from today's meeting, but uh, you know that, that plan is in action. Finding the people, oh. finding the resources that are available that we can facilitate and trying to get those projects going to the best of our ability. And then the Northeast so, Kingdom project, for instance, is one of them. So it sounds to me like the, that role is then, your, your role is coordinating yes. um, a, a piecemeal plan as, as opposed to providing an over, a, a Marshall plan. And I don't mean that to be critical. I'm well, I'm afraid it, it is at this point. We need, to, we need to pull together as a team and that is very much what the department has done in putting something on the table. And I have very much welcomed the feedback that we're getting today. The Department of Public Service is pun- punching well above its weight class in coordinating that work. But no, I don't have a Marshall plan. I don't have resources for that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, Commissioner, because I've come to the end of my list. Um, I think, there are two more hands raised there are oh there are two more hands raised okay i've got representative higley and representative Schuerman in that order but i'm going to ask mine um i think what i'm hearing people ask is if we all got together and did one of those really quick, we all agree, and as we've done a couple times this year, um, fixed all those little licensing and renewals. We did a major amendment to 310, which is sitting on the calendar with a 248A extension in it. We took care of all of those. And the legislature, and I understand the administration may have its own plans for the CARES money. But if the legislature said, no, we want to put some money to CARES extension. And the federal government sounds like it's something of a floating target as to what's allowed and what's not allowed. But if we decided we were going to put 20 million or $50 million into Uh, broadband expansion. Do we have a plan to get that on the ground built and spent by January 1st? I think 
and I, the committee, you can do a thumbs up, thumbs down, but I think that I can't read it, Senator. I think it's backwards. Um, can we, you know, is there a fallback if, if the money became available? Not enough to do a full statewide auction but maybe enough to have some impact on those red and orange. How fast, if we took care of all the licensing and permitting and assuming somewhere we found a stockpile of cable, um, is there a, a way we could get a plan up and running really quickly? And I don't know opinion, if we're discussing yeah. 25, 3, or 100, 100, Senator. I think that may depend on what technology it's possible to get where. Well, those uh, are two different questions. I don't think we can just hook cable onto everything or fiber onto everything, but I don't know. So I think well, there are two that's different questions. I don't know which one we're asking. Okay, I think we're asking how quickly we could get any, I'm asking, since I'm asking, how quickly we could get any project in and then tell us what the speed would that, what's the trade-off? If we so, go for 100, 100, how soon, and I'm not asking for now. So I think uh, that's so, what I hear the, the committee asking. I, I think there's a, a simple answer, I'm not sure sure it's an acceptable answer, but here is the answer I would give, and Clay, you'll improve upon it. You have right now an existing mechanism in statute, the Connectivity Initiative Fund, that is a mechanism by which you can, in early short order, conduct an RFP process seeking bids to build certain amounts of last mile, whatever the bid decides, uh, and they name their price. And those bids then get evaluated in conjunction with the um, Connectivity Advisory Board. Okay. Those grants can be awarded and the terms can be controlled by the state. For instance, one of the explicit terms can be, you must propose a project that is symmetrical, 100 up, 100 down. Okay. Um, as to how quickly they can be built, we can also impose you know, limits, meaning and you must have it built by December. Uh, I cannot speak to how realistic that is, but I think at some point, ladies and gentlemen, we have to make a start and we have to try. And I think we can agree that we're trying to get as much connectivity out there by the end of the year and that it makes sense to use established mechanisms to do so. Uh, frankly, I think you've already done that planning and you've put that planning in statute and that's what the connectivity initiative is for. But if you're not comfortable with that, then I would urge you, please um, give us further direction. Okay. If, if I'm, if I may, I, I think what I'm hearing. Um, Wait, I'm uh, I'm trying to figure out who's speaking. This because I can't this see is, all of you, so just identify uh, yourself. I'm sorry. This is uh, Clay. Ah, it's uh, Clay. Okay. Yeah. So, That's sorry why I don't about recognize that. your voice. Um, just uh, to, to add on to what June has said, I think what I'm hearing from the committee is that um, in our plan, you or a plan, you want to see a target, a goal, and um, a way to measure that progress toward that goal. Um, I, how many addresses can we hit? Um, how many students can we target within the next Excuse six me. months? And I, I think that's something that um, we can certainly improve upon in our final plan. Okay. Yeah, if you had to pull a couple counties, mm -hmm. what, where would you go? Right. If we came and up I, with I them. think we can provide okay. that to you. Okay. Madam right. Chair, this yes. is Senator Ballant. You've got a couple representatives who've been waiting uh, to jump in here. I do, and I, yes, I do. Wow. And I, they are on my list. And next is Representative Higley and then Representative Sherman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you can imagine, being from the Northeast Kingdom, I'm all on board with flying 150 students up here at $130,000 with that uh, New England wireless and Velcro combination. Um, 
this is, you know, again, that's kind of off the cuff, but I mean, there is an example right there that, that is a possibility of something that could work in the next eight months. Um, and this is what I'm talking about now is, it seems to me there's two different discussions here. One is CARES money being used in the next eight months, and then other money that could possibly be used for uh, this proposal that the department put together. Um, to go to Senator uh, Ballant's uh, questions and concerns around uh, students out there that possibly need uh, service. Um, I contacted my uh, uh, schools in my area, as well as as a John Peters up at the North Country Supervisory Union who put out a survey as well. His survey reached out and had 374 respondents at eight schools, but again, there was uh, a lot of schools that did their own surveys. And I'm looking at very specific information from my schools. Uh, like to just take for an example, Jay Westfield, seven families and two, two staff members with internet issues. And it sounds like they're basically around satellite and cell service. Um, Troy School, 180 students, five students with no access and about 20 families and staff, intermittent service. And again, that looks like cell service only. Um, so the, the list goes on. It's pretty specific and I'm sure they know who these families are. My point here is if we're talking about reaching these people that don't have it, that need it for school work, uh, it looks to me as though a lot of it could be um, upgraded um, cell service as well. Now I'm not a techie guy, uh, but again, if, if this is a possibility and, and one of the recommendations that came down as well was uh, you know, to make sure that S301 gets passed. That's the 248A provision around getting this, mm -hmm. these cell towers uh, cited quickly. Uh, so again, there's another example of something we can do as a legislature, get, you know, S301 over to us, get it passed out and move on with that. Um, so I don't, I don't think we should be looking at duplicating services in a sense when it comes to schools because it appears to me that a lot of that information, at least in my area, has already been pretty specific. So just, just my input, but uh, um, yeah, I think there's two separate issues here and we need to be working on both of them in a sense separately. I Thank think you. our sense is that there are, those things have been um, asked, asked for, that the individual schools are doing them, but there doesn't seem to be a central repository so that it can be mapped and put in part of a plan. And I've asked the Department of Education for that. I looks like we may need to re-ask, um, see if we can get some movement. Okay, I have Representative Sherman and then I see a Senator raising his hand, not his blue hand, but I will take Senator Pearson after Representative Sherman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Commissioner um, Tierney, I just, first of all, I do want to thank you for uh, this work, you and your staff, um, for this work on this um, action plan. And um, I think it is an excellent start and uh, brings us uh, to a place where we need to be to consider where, where we go from here. So I, I do want to recognize that, that work and uh, and thank you for it um, uh, first. My question actually goes back to schools as well, students and families in schools. And um, um, so where precisely, I notice on a, um, and I'm looking around here, there's, um, there's the interactive broadband map, um, the survey available uh, that you have. And I'm, um, um, I'm just wondering, is that the only place, I, I wasn't clear when you were talking to Senator Ballant, um, is that the only place that you are, are uh, getting the information for the connectivity um, for families and students? Um, no, we've... I, uh, Clay, just to, just to uh, um, basically I'm wondering, because I know that schools in my district, for example, and I'm sure schools all over the state have done their own um, actually analysis of who precisely needs service. So are you, are you in fact getting, reaching out to the individual schools? I don't mean the secretary of education. I mean, to the individual schools to get that information. Um, that, is, that is something that we have from a few school districts. 
Um, we'll be working to get more school districts on. Um, we've already reached out to every uh, supervisory union um, to collect that data. Sorry, I'm getting a staff. Um, yeah, every supervisory union to collect that data. So a lot of that data is coming in. And um, I do want to stress that this is not the final map. This is right. the map as of May 12th. So as we get new information, we'll be populating that map. Um, so, but the, sur so, the survey is, is one area and we do have duplicates. So we are weeding those out as well. So Clay, I, I'll just ask, um, how can we, uh, uh, especially in smaller communities, uh, again, like mine and like several of the folks here on this uh, meeting, um, we actually have those exact addresses. Um, we have them. I have them at my fingertips um, where, where they're not recognized at all, for example, on a map. It might say 103 Park Street. I, I might put in 103 Park Street and it's not recognized at all, for example. Right. Is there, how can we help you uh, or can we maybe connect uh, if there's a list that a school district that, that we have of those addresses? Should we just, how, how can we help? Is, if, or is, if, is there if, if you can get If you can give them to us, certainly that's helpful. You, identified a, a problem, a technical problem that we have to work through, which is the, the address you think you live at is not the address that the 911 da database thinks you live. So there's a, what we call geocoding the address, okay. trying to place the address with an actual physical location. And um, that's time consuming and tedious. So that's a lot of the kind of work that my staff is um, going through literally address by address. Okay. So um, so just to just to finish up, if we get um, maybe I'll just, for example, for my school district in my in my district, I maybe I'll just get the information of of locations and maybe just send that to you and you can do with what you guys yeah. do, I guess. That and, would that would okay. certainly be helpful and we'll follow up with the school district um, to make sure that um, Great. It's accurate. Uh, and again, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you, Clay, and uh, you, Commissioner, uh, for all this work. I think it's a great start, and Very hopefully welcome. we can uh, do thank it. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I've got Senator Pearson, and then I'm going to start wrapping this up. We are about a half hour, more than a half hour over time, and I don't know if the House is staying with us, but the Senate has at least one other witness. We're going to get an update on the CUDs. So, Sandra Pearson. Just a quick point of information to Representative Higley. Uh, as I understand it, the bill to extend the sunset of uh, 248 is uh, moving towards the floor. So, so it's, it's among a bunch of bills that have been requested that you know we have now going through Rules Committee, uh, given that we're working remotely. But I saw that on a list this morning. So hopefully you guys will get that uh, before too long to, to begin yeah, your work. It, it has been on my must pass list since the beginning. And we're finally starting to take things off the calendar. We did get it out by crossover. Thank you. Uh, so it's coming. Um, okay, committee, unless there is something else horribly urgent, I think we're going to wrap up this section. I don't know, Representative Brickland, are your folks going to stay with us? Uh, I don't know if they are, but I can think of nothing better to do. So I'm, I'm going to hang in there with you. So we live such exciting lives these days. <laughs> OK, Commissioner, thank you. Uh, for all the work, and I think eventually we will get through this. Um, and be able to um, see where we go. Okay. Oh, uh, Madam Chair, it's been a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to stay for Mr. Fish's testimony. Okay. But uh, it was it is new news to me that uh, the Joint Fiscal Office is going to be retaining an expert. And so I just want to offer to the extent that any of you think the department can be helpful in orienting um, those folks, uh, please let us know. We're happy to do that. Okay, I think that's fine. I think what 
we've seen as we started to work through this is that we don't have in-house expertise to help us that's yes. independent, like we have joint fiscal and we have attorneys, but we don't, and we don't even seem to have alleged counsel who's a real expert in technology. So we're trying to help us understand. That makes, per that, that makes perfect so that sense. That you can do I, your yeah. work and maybe we'll ask better questions. Oh, I, I, I thank you folks. Uh, sincerely, I really think the questions today have been very good and, um, and it's been very helpful to me. It has laid bare um, the, the fact that we don't all agree. And so uh, the, the work that you folks can do to come to consensus yourselves and let us know, that would be so very helpful. Okay. But we're definitely here to support you in your work. I think we have gotten our discussions, which is all the suggestions that you have made about licensing and permitting to help move this along, 248 being the prime one. Um, and then there's the speeds and under what conditions we might settle for what. And I think individual committees can have their own knockdown, drag out discussions, and then we'll get together and we'll probably do it all over again. But that's what we normally do. Um, it's a little different when you're not sitting at a table, but um, I think that definitely gives us some marching orders of what you need from us. So see if we can get this back on the agenda and go working with it. Okay. Well, Mr. Mr. Fish is here, and just so the members know, um, the plan itself is attracting national attention from other states. They're actually looking to Vermont to see how we handle this. So I think we have a chance to help a lot of other people. And I, I just really welcome your input. I will now be quiet and give you Mr. Fish, who I think you're really going to enjoy. Okay, well, I'm going to say welcome to Mr. Fish, because I don't know that as a committee, I'm sure as a committee, finance has not heard from him. Um, I know we authorized hiring him to help the CUDs <laughs> with the same technical issues that we have, and understanding as community members, all the intricacies of technology. So, um, Mr. Fish, the... Uh, floor is yours. I'm not seeing you on my screen. There you are. I have found you. Um, and welcome. And um, the floor is yours. I think the Senate especially was looking, you're, you're getting the calls from the, uh, you know, the uh, communications union districts, the CUDs. Um, and just what's your impression? How are they doing? What do they need to continue? Um, are they ready to play a role in any of this build out in the next six to eight months? Um, you know, how do we how do we work how do we work well with them? Because I think we see them as somewhat of the future. Uh, especially in the harder to serve rural areas. So floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, this is the first time Senate Finance is hearing from me or any legislative committee. I'm, ah. I'm new at this, so be kind. <laughs> Uh, thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committees. Uh, I came on board last November and I sum up my mission as lighting a fire under the grassroots effort to create communication union districts and expand broadband around the state. Uh, my position was created by Act 79, and I'm working closely with other units of government, nonprofits, cooperatives, for profits, you name it. Uh, my key tasks were convening and connecting different groups. I've spoken to many of the different regional planning commissions. I am speaking to many of the different CUDs on at this point, almost a daily basis, I've worked with various providers and brought various providers through the public service department to, to make their case and express their needs. I've been working on identifying the needs of the CUDs and other providers and working to leverage resources. And I think most importantly, I've been trying to prevent people from recreating the wheel 
there is expertise out there with the various CUDs, and I want to make sure that is shared among all the CUDs. And that is something I'll get to later. I think there's a real opportunity to further increase cooperation between the communication union districts. Uh, to give a little background on the timeline to show the progress we made and where we might be going, uh, I have it in my testimony, I have a timeline and Clay, if you would put up the, the map of the communication union districts, please. I'll, I'll be there in a minute. I'm okay. still pulling it up. Well, to get started, uh, the first communication union district was started in 2011. It wasn't officially a communication union district at that point, and that is EC Fiber. In 2018, CV Fiber was created. In 2020, we now have the Northeast Kingdom Broadband, Deerfield Valley Communications District, Southern Vermont Communication Union Districts. There was 41 or 44 towns that voted at town meeting in March to create these methods of assisting their communities in deploying broadband. I cannot, I can't say enough how inspired I am by the efforts of the CUDs, of what they've been able to accomplish in such little time. And I, I was shocked when I came on, came on board for the first meeting of, I believe it was the Deerfield Valley CUD or it was Southern Vermont and just of how organized and how far they've come already. So you'll see on your screen right now the, the map of where we stand right now uh, with the various CUDs. Uh, if, if in the Northeast Kingdom, if Clay scrolls up a little bit, you'll see the um, NEK broadband. And you'll see going down, you'll see CV fiber, EC fiber. And then in the southern part of the state, you have the Deerfield Valley CUD and Southern Vermont uh, Communication Union District. Uh, you've seen a version of this map before, but almost every day over the past two weeks, it's been changing. Uh, the Deerfield Valley CUD just yesterday added Jamaica as a, as, as a member. And I expect to see a continuation of that expansion throughout all of Wyndham County. You wanna scroll down there a little bit to see the, one of my favorite parts of the state there, Clay? So as you can see, it's, it's expanded from when it first started. Uh, the next map that Clay will bring up is showing where we're going. We've already, we run the Broadband Innovation Grant Program. And as a result of that program, we've already received letters of interest uh, from groups around the state. We also recently awarded uh, three new grants in a early decision round and I'll talk briefly about those when we get to the next slide. Uh oh. <laughs> well, I'll talk about those. We we awarded last week grants to. There it is. Here we go. Here we go. It's very colorful. I I apologize for any lack of clarity, uh, but what I attempted to do in this map is to give a snapshot of of what's happening around the state. And first, a disclaimer: I'm trying to know everything that's happening around the state. I'm only one person. So I apologize, mm -hmm. especially for the independent efforts if I've missed anybody. And these are the, our active efforts that I'm showing. But as you'll see on this map, if you see in the purple, where you have Eden, Johnson, Cambridge, Belvedere, Hyde Park, Wolcott, that is a new CUD that is ready to go. They're waiting to get started. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the needs, but they were just awarded a feasibility grant. Um, there's also, if you look over to Rutland County, we know they've submitted a letter of intent for to serve part of their county as a communication union district. And we just heard from Addison County. So it, things are happening all across the state. And I said my mission was to light a fire and to support those trying to light a fire. I'm gonna continue plugging along with that. And I thank you for your support and the support of all the different actors around the state that are working on this to all hours of the night based on the emails I receive. So the, the next thing I wanted to, uh, to touch base on, unless you have questions, we can stop and take questions on those maps if it would be helpful, Any Madam Chair. On the maps. I am not, uh, I have <laughs> Representative Briglin. Thanks, um, this is terrific work. And I just wanted to one pass along that, um, you know, the CUDs that we've talked to around the state and our committee, we've heard great feedback on the work you're doing, Rob. So 
Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we can clone you uh, in the coming coming months and years because I think your work is uh, incredibly valuable. A question I have that, that comes out of the maps is, um, are you finding that there's an optimal size for a CUD? As you get more towns involved in a CUD, um, there's more uh, hurdles to overcome to roll out connectivity. Um, you know, you can only do so many towns at a time, so you have a larger CUD and there's challenges there. But I'm presuming there's also um, economies, economies of scale as you bring more towns together to, um, you know, overlay the cost for what the CUD has done. Are you finding from all these CUDs you're working with that uh, there's an optimal size. Some of these are quite small. Uh, the Northeast Kingdom CUD looks like it potentially is going to get much larger. Any thoughts on that? I think it's a balancing act. There's various factors you have to weigh. You have to weigh the number of addresses left to be served versus the number of people you want sitting at a table or on a conference call or a Zoom meeting uh, attempting to make these decisions. Uh, you also have to weigh if you're gonna be operating this network, how far is it economical for a service truck to travel? Because we wanna be sure that any of these networks that are created through these communication union districts really support and benefit their community and do so in a way that has excellent customer service. So I don't think there's any set size. I think we're still in a phase right now where we're ex experimenting the various communication union districts are working with each other and discussing. There may be mergers for all we know. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities of where this is gonna go. There's also the various communication union districts that are looking to expand. Like, even on this map, I don't have the next towns in line for EC fiber or for CV fiber. Uh, there's a, a lot of things are in flux at this point and all these CUDs are performing feasibility studies and business planning and much of that will be flushed out in that process. And just related, um, in terms of the, the service that you supply and the help that you supply for these CUDs around the state, um, and, and maybe this isn't as answerable at this point, but I'm curious if there is ultimately a statewide resource, uh, statewide office that helps with um, CUD work around the state, whether it's grant writing, legal work, fundraising, things that all CUDs do that maybe are not the most economical way for individual CUDs to be spending their time. I, I would agree that there's an opportunity and it's an opportunity that we're doing our best to fulfill. Um, for instance, with uh, Northern Borders, uh, the Northern Borders Regional Commission grants that are coming up. There has been discussion among all the CUDs and most of the CUDs don't feel that they're in a place to apply for an infrastructure for a construction grant. Uh, the department is taking that on as a way of potentially assisting pre-vetted groups uh, expand broadband in their community. Uh, there's also, I was going to get to this a little bit later on, there's talk right now between the communication union districts of creating some sort of consortium to work with either partnering amongst themselves or maybe with the utilities and a provider. Uh, there's a lot of different questions, but to make the, the CUDs more competitive and frankly able to participate at all in the upcoming FCC uh, Rural Development Opportunity Fund auction. So there is a room for there, there's certainly room for more coordination and we're moving in that direction. Like one of my goals from the beginning was to make sure that these groups that are scattered around the state are talking to each other. Great, Th thank you. And, and thanks for all your great work. Thank you. Okay, any other questions at this point? Okay, don't see any, <laughs> so. Great. Mr. Fish, it's back to you. Back to me. Uh, so, the, so, the, you. so at, like as I've said, a lot of my work is soliciting feedback from the communication union districts. I want to know and understand their needs. I want to offer advice where I can. I want to connect them to resources where I can. And as part of that process over the past, really over the past few days, I've been starting to solicit feedback on the emergency broadband action plan. And just in general, like what do the what do these communication union districts need to get started and succeed and move from the organizational stage to the deployment stage? 
Uh, so I compiled that feedback. I, first, a disclaimer, it's not exhaustive. Uh, there's also some differences between the various communication districts, and I encourage the committee to invite those communication union districts into to have their own say, to share about their projects, to share their passion, and to share what they need to be successful. Uh, so I'm going to provide a little bit of an, an overview, not an exhaustive list mm -hmm. of the feedback I've heard from them. To be clear, this is from them. This is not from the department. Uh, and so the first thing that was identified, and this came out of efforts in Lamoille County, uh, as well as several of the other CUDs, the Lamoille County issue came out of those groups that want to get started right now. And current law requires, in order for a communication union district to, to get started, to become official, two, at least two towns have to hold votes at town meeting. In normal times, they could hold a special town meeting. We're not in normal times right now. Can you all imagine a Zoom, trying to do a Zoom call with 150 members of your community? No. Uh, so there's been a call for seeking a change in the legislation, uh, change in the law, I apologize, to come up with some sort of temporary measure that allows communication union districts to be created without going through the town meeting. So probably created by the select board um, there's a lot of details to work out, but that's a concern in Lamoille County. And I know with the, the new efforts that are underway in Rutland and Addison, it may be a concern there as well. So that is one thing that they think the legislature could do as a way of moving things forward, even during these emergency times. Okay. The, other, the other issue I'm hearing from several communication union districts is they're in, they're in a strange place. So they're a municipal organization, but they're also operating in a competitive landscape. So figuring out how to make those work together with having enough transparency, but also not having a situation where a potential competitor can take your feasibility study and your engineering study and all of your plans because it's a public record and beat you to it. So it's figuring out how to balance the, the public interest and the building it, the business interest is a challenge that many of them are facing and are looking for direction and clarification in terms of what is public, what is protected, and how to move forward. So the, the second issue, and this, is, this issue is shared by all of the CUDs, is capacity building. These are all volunteer run. Volunteers can only do so much and can only wear so many hats. It's a challenge. So actually, I, is there some questions right now? I see a giant question mark, Senator McDonald. Oh, yes, <laughs> Senator McDonald, raise your hand. I'll get to you. I've got Representative Sebelia first. I'm taking notes, so I'm not watching as closely as I should. Okay. Sure, and, Ma Sebelia, and Madam Chair, if it's a question, and then I'll get to Senator McDonald. Just really briefly, um, back to Rob's um, discussion about the problem with organizing right now during the CUD. Um, we Maria is working um, with GovOps on a bill right now. Uh, to address that in the, on the House okay. side, so. And I think if you can send us this list or email it to Faith, um, that would be helpful because I am taking copious notes here thinking that we may put together some kind of committee bill or bills um, with the groundwork all the licensing and permitting and other things that might be necessary so that when we find the money, we're ready to go and go quickly. So, um, Senator McDonald, I have somebody else. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I believe the witness is speaking about CUDs and the, and about how the, it's difficult to operate in a competitive environment. Um, when one of the things that helped um, EC Fiber get started was that they didn't have a lot of cable in that district. They had pretty much nothing. So EC Fiber was, you could predict that it would have a good take up rate and it could pay its bills. Today, we're discussing on one hand, sending money 
to cable companies to build out um, 25.3. And every time someone purchases or signs up for 25.3, it makes it more difficult and less likely for the neighbors farther down the road to ever have uh, a, a modern um, business friendly broadband system where in weeks like this, people don't have to leave home because there are three kids and two people trying to work online with 25.3 that's inadequate. My apologies for okay. the, long, the long thing. Um, as someone who's working with CUDs, how do you advise us not to endorse short-term policies that would obstruct our goals to make this state a competitive state for broadband? How do we resist putting in 25.3 if it means it's gonna be more expensive to serve the rest of the areas? Thank you. Okay. Any suggestions there? And I can I can touch on that. It's a it's a one of my later points. And also, Madam Chair, this document was provided to Faith and is up on the site. So okay. Don't don't worry too much about the note taking. Great. So I can watch the blue hands. <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll skip ahead. I want to make sure I go back to my points two and three. But points four was. The CUDs are concerned. They're concerned about 25-3 versus 100-100, but they also understand the challenge of that we're in an emergency situation and need to serve as many people as possible. Their advice is to figure out a way to do it in a way that doesn't, doesn't prohibit future solutions so that any build out that's less than 100 and 100 has to have a very visible, very clear plan of how it is going to be 100-100. Uh, they're very concerned about bonded DSL, which is basically two DSL lines put together to achieve 25.3, and that's where it maxes out. Uh, they do share the concern that as if cable lines continue to be ex extended, that it's reducing the number of potential people that would subscribe to their service, at least initially, or require additional overbuilding later on. Uh, but I, I must say that is the concern of the communication union mm -hmm. districts. Uh, okay. So I do want to I do want to go I had, back. Oh, I oh. had one more question from Representative Pat before we go on. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, on 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 the same subject, uh, I, I just wonder whether uh, what the and they, they may be thinking differently, but in, depending on their territory, whether uh, uh, CUDs, and I asked this question in, in our committee when we were still meeting in, in our room, um, whether they uh, are thinking that they, it's their intent to try to serve uh, everybody in a town, even if there is uh, uh, one or two or maybe three other providers that provide some level of service to different parts of the town, or whether they're really just going for the unserved area. And I'm sure there may be different approaches. So I think the longer term goal is to provide universal service availability for their entire town, but they understand that initially they are going to be building out to areas that are not served at, the, they're going to be building out to the unserved areas first. They're not going to be overbuilding cable. Okay. Okay, oh, I, I Representative Sebelia has a uh, question. So actually, Madam Chair, a comment. Um, I heard reference to uh, bonded DSL at 25.3 speeds, and that's not accurate. I believe the max that bonded DSL can do is 25.2, and I've been told that from um, the telephone provider. Okay. Hey, so, thank you, think, thank you, Laura, for the correction there. Yeah, I, Representative well, I think Sebelia. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just really important to be very clear about that. We have a lot 
of DSL. And so bonded DSL, you know, that's not going to get us to 25. Okay, that's, may, that's may not I, on the good list. Add, add a clarification to my question, Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Thank you. It, 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 is, it is very profitable in this country today to be a cable company and I will use the term sell beads and trinkets to the indigenous people. You can make a lot of money. Um, you, how do we move beyond beads and trinkets to provide people with a future broadband without when, when, it, when the federal government encourages us to pay the expenses for the people who sell beads and trinkets so that they can sell that stuff. How do we step in, in, in their way and say, no, um, our future is, is not in this, is going in this direction. Maybe we'll get to that from the Maybe witness we before will. we're done. Thank you. Okay, Rob, back to you. Back to me. I, I apologize. You do not have an answer to that question, Senator McDonald. Uh, I wish I did. Else. <laughs> uh, so I want to. I want to go back a little bit. Uh, the second key thing that the communication union districts asked me to discuss was the need for capacity building. As I said, that they're all volunteers, and they're starting in many cases with zero funding, where they don't have funding for postage. Never mind funding for the legal expenses that are necessary in negotiating a public private partnership or some of the mapping needs that they have or the general administrative and grants management type things. So there's a need for capacity building. And that is one thing that we've included in the emergency broadband plan that I'd, I'd ask that you, that you would consider. Uh, it is a, the, probably the number one request from the communication union districts. Okay. So, and that comes for like incidentals, expertise, and for infrastructure. It's without assets to start, it's hard to leverage those assets to get additional funding from the private market. The, the VITA loans, the VITA broadband expansion loans require at least a 10% match. At this early stage with the communication union districts, that is a challenge. Uh, the third point I wanna talk on, and this goes back to the collaboration effort is preparing the communication union districts to be able to participate in the FCC RDOF fund. Uh, within the broadband emergency plan, there is the uh, requesting, a, having the state provide a letter of credit. Uh, that is one obstacle. There is no other way that I can see that the communication union districts are gonna overcome that requirement. Uh, the other requirement is a track record. Uh, for the track record, many of the communication union districts are discussing creating a consortium among all of the communication districts, potentially in partnership with various utilities or another provider. Uh, they are looking for expertise to help guide that process. We are assisting with uh, convening some of that, but having someone that is, that is outside and experienced with RDOF to pull that together and make sure the interests of the CUD are represented is a key ask. Uh, we already talked on the 25-3 versus 100-100. Uh, uh, the, uh, another concern is backhaul and middle mile. They are incredibly excited and thankful for our commissioner here for pulling together Velco and the utilities to start the discussion on whether they could be used for backhaul to assist these new efforts. Uh, at this point, there's a lot of details to still be worked out. And in many ways, it's a, it's a chicken and an egg type issue where various people want an actual price on the fiber or what's available when it may be situational to whatever a communication union district proposes. This is something that's being worked out. I know there's an important phone call tomorrow on that, but they're very thankful for that and would love any legislative support that's required to make it make it available for utilities to partner with CUDS if any additional is necessary. Uh, they're also interested in additional data on, on backhaul of where the fiber is. So there's a few other additional concerns I wanna to get to really quick. I know it's been a long day. Uh, one thing that is in the, in the emergency broadband plan is loosening the restriction on the ability of municipalities to 
the ability of CUDs to use tax-derived revenue. Uh, the feedback I've received on that is almost a resounding no, that the timing is not right for that, and that is part of their promise to the communication districts, and especially now with all the other added expenses that communities are facing, that's something that they don't feel at the time is right. It's still a wait and see is what they recommend. Uh, what I've heard from several CUDs though, is there's one situation that they that doesn't make sense to them and they see could be an opportunity. Uh, currently, a town can contract with a private company to build out fiber in their community. So it will be the town paying a company to build out fiber that they won't own. The other company will continue to own it. So a town can do that with the cable company or with any other private company. They cannot do that with a communication union district. So that's one place that they are at a disadvantage. Uh, there wasn't universal agreement on that. That's something I encourage you to ask the individual communication union districts for more information on that. The other feedback was the just the, the administrative and the complexity of a reverse auction. And their, their preference is to maintain the ability to say what happens in their territory since they are the closest to their, their towns and can represent the interests of their towns, but perhaps doing it in terms of, terms of block grants uh, that would be distributed by the communication union districts or used by the communication districts. They thought that that could be a, a quicker way of moving forward. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is the communication union districts are looking at this as in an emergency situation and figuring out in between steps to providing the universal fiber. I had a great conversation with, uh, with CV Fiber about how they're looking at ways to map out their network where instead of bringing fiber at this point to the farmer that's two miles up the road, that they bring fiber to the beginning of the road and then use a wireless situation, a, wire, a wireless solution, and then build that later. So they are thinking in those terms and attempting to be as creative as possible. So that's what I have. There are plenty of other concerns and interests. I encourage you to talk to them. I hope I did them justice in sharing their interests and now I welcome questions. Okay, any questions at this point? I uh, just uh, Senator Campion here for I just have yes. A okay, Senator Campion. Uh, Robert, thanks. Senator so is not well trained when it comes to the use of blue hands. No, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Even though Senator Cummings has been trying to train me on a number of things, I have been trying to train the entire committee, but I. Stand uh, this is all new to all of us. <laughs> right, Rob. Uh, again, thanks. Would you just uh, reiterate what you said some of the top priorities are for the CUDs at this point? You said it, you know. A, a half sure. A so. Sure. So the top so the top priorities are one, creating an emergency way to create a communication union district mm -hmm. and addressing some of the some of the, the the concerns over what is protected information, so they can remain competitive. Uh, the second one is capacity building, which is a need for funding for incidentals, for expertise, and to get started, to have the seed funding to be able to make the matches to build infrastructure. The third one is to preparing the communication union districts to participate in the FCC RDOF program. Uh, this is of building that consortium, of having the techni technical assistance more than I can provide uh, and, and very specialized about RDOF and representing the interests of the communication union district. The fourth priority was the concern, but a realization that it might be necessary at times, uh, the 25-3 versus the 100 by 100 uh, in terms of speed and wanting to make sure that any funds that go to anything that's less than less than 100 by 100, that a requirement be that the provider, whoever is doing that project, has a plan and accountability to achieving 100-100. Uh, the, the final thing was the backhaul and middle mile of supporting the efforts with, that, with the CUDs working with the utilities to access various uh, middle mile and to partner with utilities to solve this statewide problem. It's gonna take all hands on deck to make this work. Thank um, so. Okay. So one, oh, actually one other thing I wanna to mention to the committee that would be of interest is some of my other work has led me to be working with uh, working with the telehealth working group. 
like as I ah. said, this is all hands on, on deck and providing them with information on various grants available. And I'm happy to report that at least one grant from the FCC tele, um, telehealth program is gonna be coming to Vermont. I don't know if it's been publicly announced yet, so I'm not gonna say who it is, but we have had some success and that's part of the convening role and part of the sharing resources that we as the department are doing. Well, considering the health and welfare has been taking testimony on telemedicine and we haven't heard, I'm gonna assume that it hasn't been made public yet because <laughs> we've done several days of testimony on that. So any other questions at this point? All right, I'm going to scan for senators. I'm not seeing any blue or any other color hands. So I think that's it. Uh, committee, committees, Representative Brigland, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having us today, Madam Chair. Really I appreciate think it. we'll probably need to keep working at least in tandem. Um, if we're going to get any of this done in the time frames we've got left, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, we may committee have to start meeting more often than once a, yeah, once a week. Um, if we have to start taking up a bunch of bills. On Thursday, we're going to do the interstate nurse licensure compact. Um, we're going to hear from the uh, providers who asked to talk to us on the emergency broadband plan. And we're going to at least do our first walkthrough of the banking and insurance bill um, that has come over. So that's it. We are, as by tradition, skipping all around all kinds of topics. Um, next week, we've got a couple of other bills we need to take up. The two we heard from Health and Welfare last week. Um, I've talked to Senator Sorotkin about my feelings about tax credits at this time of large deficits, but we're gonna hear from the administration. I think we're trying to set that up Tuesday, if not Thursday, but I think it's Tuesday. Um, so we can start taking a look at some of these bills and deciding what we want to do with them. Um, I think that's it, unless somebody else has questions. Uh, Madam Chair, I just wonder if you yes. would stay line a couple minutes after we adjourn uh, regarding a, a separate issue. Okay, no problem. I just tell Faith, don't shut us out. Okay. Okay, well, thank you all. We will see you Thursday. Thank you. And okay. new live stream.